why South Australians will need to find a new meeting place for a while. This is Adelaide's National Nine News with Georgina McGinnis. Good evening. The state government stands accused of being caught out tonight by a change to daylight saving interstate that threatens to cause disruption here. The eastern states will move their clocks before us, creating a 90-minute time difference. The government says it will now consult the business community, farmers and others before deciding whether we'll join the shift. Business leaders are furious over the inconvenience that the change will cause. And sun lovers are puzzled too. I think it's nice to be able to go outside and enjoy the sunshine as much as possible. I think um, probably be a bit silly to be different. People won't pay out in Adelaide as much. They won't say we're behind the times. For three weeks in October, South Australia will be 90 minutes behind Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. At last week's COAG meeting, those states agreed to line up with Tasmania's early start to daylight saving. The opposition claims the RAND government was caught on the hop. Why did they go off to COAG and not uh, have a prepared plan on this? They knew it was on the agenda. We're not simply going to follow suit because the Eastern Seaboard has done it. On Friday, the Premier's department ruled out any chance of going along with the change this summer. But now, it seems, the door might be open. If there is to be a change, there may well be some merit to that. But of course, people need to make their case. We will consult with the uh, community and see what the community wants out of daylight saving. The business community has urged the state government to even go a step further, eliminating the usual half-hour time difference with the eastern states. It is a question that the state government needs to face up to. And it will also need to face up to a virtual repeat of October's dilemma when South Australia finishes daylight saving two weeks earlier than the eastern states in March. Chris Salter, National 9 News. Victoria's health department chief has been sacked over a food poisoning outbreak that killed four residents in a nursing home. Robert Hall, who once held a similar position here in South Australia, received his marching orders amid fears that the outbreak is spreading. Another day and more drama at the Broughton Hall aged care facility. A food poisoning outbreak that may have led to four deaths, forcing another two residents to hospital. The first an elderly man whose family demanded urgent action. He has deteriorated dr dramatically over a, a couple of weeks since we've seen him. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he should have been in hospital when a lot earlier. Half an hour later, a woman was taken from the nursing home. Both patients were suffering the effects of gastroenteritis. Very bad, it is very bad. Disinfecting the facility has allowed families to resume visits. In total, 21 residents have been affected. While the outbreak appears to be under control, management has accepted full responsibility. We recognise that we should have made further attempts to contact the emergency number. Uh, the department, as I said, are not to blame for not having the information. The health minister was in the dark until yesterday, but she's responded swiftly. I have lost confidence in the chief health officer and uh, his position will be terminated as of today. While tests have confirmed one patient still recovering in hospital has contracted salmonella poisoning, autopsies will reveal how the four residents died. Clint Stanaway, National 9 News. A smoke alarm and some quick-thinking neighbours have saved the life of an elderly man at Woodville Park. Fire broke out inside his Windsor Avenue home just after 6.30. After hearing the alarm, he tried to put out the flames, but he was overcome by smoke. Neighbours dialed triple O and helped the man to get out. He was taken to hospital suffering smoke inhalation. And the fire is not considered suspicious. After 30 years of taking pride of place in the heart of our city, the mole's balls have been bounced out. It means thousands of us will have to find a new meeting place, but thankfully not for long. They'll be back after a good spit and polish. They're synonymous with Rundle Mall, a popular meeting place and an icon of Adelaide. So it was no wonder a few heads turned as the mole's balls were removed from their famous position. No work in town. And I thought, oh my God, they're taking them away. It's Adelaide. That's what makes Adelaide is the balls. It's a bit sad to see them not in the mall at the moment. Yeah, but I hear they're coming back, so that's good news. Back after a long overdue makeover. And the small dents will be pulled out. The stainless steel will be built up in a couple of places. And they'll get rid of all of those little scratches and chewy stains. Years of love and attention from locals and tourists alike had left the icon worse for wear. Around the world, they've become a symbol of Adelaide. And, and we're just keen that they're absolutely at their best. I shine them up and um, bring them back. <laughs> it's the first time the two-ton sculpture has been moved since 1990. 
the, the balls did get a bit wobbly 17 years ago and we had to do some work on them. It will take around eight weeks for the balls to be fully refurbished and reinstalled. But until then, the fountain might just become Rundle Mall's new meeting place. Kate Collins, National 9 News. And the state government has urged small shops to voluntarily remain closed before midday on Anzac Day. The government says the move would be a gesture of respect for diggers who will stage their annual march on Wednesday week. Large stores are compelled to close on Anzac morning, even those that are normally exempt from restrictions. They include hardware, carpet and furniture stores. A 13-year-old girl has been severely mauled by a sea lion north of Perth. Ella Murphy suffered a broken jaw and deep wounds to her chin when the animal attacked her while she was on her surfboard. Experts say it was a freak incident, but warn that sea lions can be aggressive if they're provoked. It's a pretty big animal. If they're in their breeding season, you go into their territory, then sure, they can get aggressive, they'll defend themselves. Wildlife officers hope to remove the animal from the area, but they're unlikely to kill it as it is a protected species. Jetstar is under fire for leaving 300 Australian travellers stranded at Honolulu Airport for two days. The passengers claim the discount airline chose to wait until a technical problem was fixed instead of organising another plane to bring them home. Bargain flights to Hawaii. The catch? Expect delays. They will never fly Jetstar ever again. I mean, there was no one there to help us out. People were stuck there for three days. Jetstar was struggling to explain. We haven't had the best of weekends. At Honolulu Airport, passengers flying to Sydney and Melbourne were told there was a technical problem with their aircraft. Two days later, they were still waiting to board the plane. Not lazing on the beach, but in the airport lounge. They were just lying to us. They weren't giving, giving us any information at all. Not once have we seen a Jetstar representative until we arrived here today. I've noted some criticism that we didn't keep customers informed. Uh, we reject that on the basis that they were given regular updates. When the fuel gauge of the aircraft was eventually fixed and the 300 stranded holidaymakers finally made it home, Jetstar delayed passengers again. We don't know where our bags are, we don't know what was wrong with the plane, we just got kept waiting and waiting and waiting. We think we've done a pretty good job considering the difficult circumstances. The budget airline says this is the first significant delay to any of its international flights and 14 million passengers have been happy to fly with Jetstar. But we think people will continue to fly with us. Bethany Jensen, National 9 News. The party could soon be over for Australian wine lovers who've been cashing in on the current oversupply. Experts are predicting prices are set to jump, especially at the lower end of the market, largely due to the drought. Wine cheaper than bottled water, premium labels at bargain prices. Australian wine lovers have never had it so good. If you drink uh, 15 to 30 dollar wines in this country you're drinking some of the best value wines in the world some of the best wines in the world last year non-labeled clean skins were selling for two dollars a bottle thanks to a glut in wine production i'll just take those three things those. but a combination of the drought frosts and bushfires has cut this year's vintage by 40 to 50 percent and the industry says the days of heavy discounting are drawing to an end it ought to stop pretty soon not so good for consumers, but a welcome relief for producers. Pricing has been at, at an unsustainable level. It's been at a level where growers and winemakers haven't been able to make a profit. It wasn't sustainable. We were going to see more and more people go to the, to the wall. So the advice from some experts is buy up now while the cheap prices last. And they warn it won't just be the lower end of the market that will feel the squeeze. Certainly, I reckon by next Christmas, a lot of the clean skins will start to dry up and we'll start to see some of the premium wines you know, get back to their real levels. Especially if, as some predict, next year's harvest is also hit by the drought. Time, perhaps, to consider an investment in the future. Go hard on the 2005 Reds if you want to put things away. That's the real tip. Brad Schmidt, National 9 News. Next in National 9 News, the joyride that ended in a fiery crash and the hero who saved a teenager's life. Plus, the royal romance gone wrong. Why is it over for William and Kate? No, you're not seeing things. 
on 60 Minutes, The Wolf Man. One over two. Yes, he's for real. 20 years eating, sleeping, living with the pack. You do have to have an element of craziness. Also, <laughs> Kevin Rudd, Liz Hayes, and a few home truths. How do you take the mickey out of it? Let me count the way. <laughs> Toyota presents 60 Minutes, tonight. Reduces greenhouse gases by one ton per year. Hybrid Synergy Drive by Toyota. LG's new DVR TVs allow you to pause, rewind, and replay live TV. And when you replay, you can skip straight back to the action. LG, life's good. Ricola Herb Drops are made in Switzerland with Swiss Alpine herbs. Naturally soothing and refreshing. And a great taste, naturally. Ricola. Need a hand with your business? Want to lower the cost of your repetitive work? Hands on SA specialise in training manuals, labeling, packaging, shrink wrapping, collating, brochures, handouts, promotional packs, anything you don't have time for. We'll start as soon as you deliver. Phone us today. Hands on SA. Yeah. Taxi. Oh, hey, my thumb thumb. How are you, Adolfo? It's amazing where life can take you when you don't have to worry about a thing back home. Avail, Australia's leading provider of retirement lifestyles. Live well. You think you've aged gracefully. She thinks you're letting yourself go. Do something. Men Expert Vitalift Complete Anti-Aging Moisturizer revitalizes and firms the appearance of the skin. Men Expert from L'Oreal Paris. Because you're worth it too. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, was your killing Demetrius James excusable? CSI Sunday. A ghost from the past. Well, you have no idea what you killed. You killed my brother. Cast doubt over a good cop's future. And this one's got to be seen to be believed. New season CSI and CSI Miami. You got him. CSI Sunday, tonight from 8.30. A teenager caught in a fiery crash after a high-speed joyride in Melbourne owes his life to the remarkable bravery of a nearby resident. The man risked his own life to free the boy from the wreckage and then drag him to safety. <laughs> A teenager trapped inside the wreckage. And only minutes later... There's a fire! Everyone stand back! Everyone stand back, all right? A nightmare realised. The 17-year-old passenger owing his life to a local resident who risked his own to help pull him free. I think it was so much, so much pain. He was screaming. I just thought, just get him out of the car. Just quickly get him out of the car. And his feet was burning, I believe. Inexperienced youth driving uh, recklessly uh, in uh, suburban side streets. Four teenagers were in the car when it ran off the road, smashing into a fire hydrant and rolling into a tree. By the time fire crews arrived, flames were threatening to spread. Locals confirming there'd been no fatalities. Everyone out? The trapped boy suffered burns to his legs and cuts to his face. Another was taken to a nearby hospital. Colin McLean still can't believe they walked away virtually unscathed. Kind of lucky stars, I say. Very, very lucky people. They'll still be alive. Police are questioning the 17-year-old driver who is unlicensed and initially fled the scene of the accident. The reluctant hero hoping the close call will teach the youth a lesson. I don't speed. Christ's sake. Please don't speed. I'm mad. Martin Alpin's National 9 News. More than 50 people have died and hundreds more have been wounded in a series of bombings across Iraq. In the most deadly attack, a suicide bomber drove a car filled with explosives into a crowded bus station in the holy city of Kabbalah. In Baghdad, 10 people were killed in the second bombing in just three days on one of the city's major bridges. 
Well, Britain's in a frenzy of speculation about the end of the romance between Prince William and Kate Middleton. While the palace won't comment, most agree that the split occurred because Kate felt that the prince wasn't paying her enough attention. For Kate Middleton, it seems the fairy tale is over. Five years after she and William began their relationship, British newspapers say the couple has split. When they first met at university in those delightful days, away from any media attention, fast forward that on five years to today, and uh, in recent weeks, um, Kate's been lucky if she's even seen William once a week. As a junior army officer, the prince is based at a country barracks, while Kate was left in London to deal with the paparazzi. But it seems his recent preference for drinking with army colleagues on weekends instead of seeing his girlfriend had caused great strain. And this picture, snapped in a nightclub last month, didn't help. The palace has refused to confirm the split, saying it never comments on William's private life. But friends of both say it's true, adding that William had had enough of the growing pressure on him to marry, a move they say he's not yet ready to make with Kate or anyone else. Some royal watchers suggest the 25-year-old will be better off without the media attention, so often compared to the treatment William's mother endured. Either way, the second in line to the throne now reclaims the title of world's most eligible bachelor, while the British people go back to guessing just who their future queen might be. In London, James Talia, National 9 News. Mark's along with the Sunday Sport and only one unbeaten side left in the AFL. That's amazing. Yes, the West Coast Eagles mm -hmm. last year's Premier stand alone at the top of the ladder mm -hmm. after the weekend's round. Hi everyone, highlights from all the day's action ahead. Port prepares for the next fortnight without two of its stars. And Manchester United have one hand on the FA Cup. Could you find the strength to stay alive in open water, surrounded by sharks? I'm gonna die! They live to tell their story. I shouldn't be alive. Tuesday, 9.35. They're right up there for looks and performance. And right now, when you upgrade to a Mazda, you upgrade to great value. Mazda 2 Neo with free upgrade to power windows and power mirrors, just $14,990. Or get a free upgrade to a Tribute V6 at a four-cylinder price from only $31,990. Upgrade to a Mazda. Great value at your Mazda dealer now. Need printing done in a flash? Just get on the phone and call the rat. Business cards. 500 business cards, just $88. The printing hub, here's what to do. Just get on the phone and call and the rat. And check out our great prices, big fella. It's only a few k's over, wasn't it? It's a short, it's short in 10 minutes. Well, the guy in front of me, he, he was going just as fast as I was. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running late. Like, running late. Like, I'm running late. Like, like. Speeding. There's no excuse. Well, well, I was down at the pub, and it was trivia night. We had this discussion or argument. All right, it was a fight over some fact. Oh, you're joking. You're joking. It turns out this clown was right. Yeah, you know, well, the beast is a gonna. Oh, come on, mate, it wasn't me. I didn't bite him. Why would I bite him? Anyway, I've just eaten. I had a pie. Life's simpler with answers on your mobile. For a demonstration, visit Optus today. Yeah. Slider Shoes for Men. They've done it for 130 years. Great shoes, top value. Slatters, look for them. Buy style and you'll discover comfort. CSI New York, Monday, 9.35, after 1 versus 100.
Welcome back. Port Adelaide's ruck stocks will be put to the test in the next two weeks with scans revealing Dean Brogan will be sidelined with a severely sprained ankle. Rising star Daniel Pearce is also unlikely to return next week because of a hamstring strain. It looked ugly and many were expecting the worst, but x-rays on Dean Brogan's left ankle this morning confirmed there was no fracture. But the severe sprain will still sideline the informed ruckman for two weeks. The injury adding further pain to Port's showdown wash-up, with Daniel Pearce also to miss at least another week with a hamstring strain. The players blaming missed opportunities for the defeat. We went inside 50 more times than, than they did. Uh, we won the clearances. We got a lot of the things we wanted to do uh, worked. And it was just the, the finishing off. Um, it was mainly the goals on the run and the snaps. We kicked one goal late and you know, those sort of things. If you, if you end up kicking five of those goals, you know, you're right in the game. And the power remains upbeat despite the loss, believing its third quarter fight back was a significant positive to take into Saturday's clash with Collingwood. We showed a lot in the second half. Uh, we came back from a position that we you know, could have very easily lost that sort of game by 10 goals, and it shows a lot of the, the character that the group's got this year. The Crows emerged from the showdown unscathed and expect Matthew Bode and Rob Shirley to be available for next week's home game against Sydney as expectations of another premiership assault begin to rise. We certainly didn't meet our expectations in round one, um, so it's been good to, to um, you know, perform the way, we, the way we wanted in the last couple of weeks. Corey Norris, National 9 News. The Kangaroos and Hawthorne are currently locked in battle at the Telstra Dome. It's early in the third quarter with the Roos desperate for victory after dropping the first two games of the season. Daniel Wells got his side off to the perfect start with the first goal of the match before Jared Roughhead in for Trent Crowe slotted a brilliant goal through from a tight angle close to the boundary. Melbourne's season has sunk further into the mire. The Cats ran rampant to win by 52 points with second gamer Tom Hawkins booting four goals. Jimmy Bartell had 35 touches and 10 marks. Nathan Ablett was a very late withdrawal, injured in the warm-up, but it was a former cat Brent Maloney who starred early for the D's with two goals. Maloney, who's thriving on the occasion and gives it a ride. It'll run away. It's all the way. But from there, it was all Geelong in the first half, highlighted by the brilliant Tom Hawkins. Who can now kick a goal. How about that one? The second gamer was unstoppable on the lead. Oh, this kid is smart too. By midway through the second term, he had all four of his first half goals. Another youngster, Travis Varco, helping the Cats to a 46-point lead at the main break. I don't think he touched it. The Cats booted another three goals to one in the third term, and it had turned into a gentle Sunday stroll. From about 55, telling kick. Geelong were quite literally flying. Terrific mark by Johnson. And by the final change, it opened up an unbeatable lead. Chris Moore likes it. He's got two. Now he's got three. The steam went out of the match in the final term. Bartell sealing the 52-point victory. Jimmy Bartell delivers. Chris Jones, National 9 News. And Sydney kicked the last six goals of the game to end Brisbane's unbeaten start to the season. The Swans strangled the life out of the Lions with no Brisbane player having more than 16 touches. It was a sensational opening quarter and a fitting start for O'Loughlin. Happy 250th, Mickey O. But from there, the big guns took over. Jonathan Brown for Brisbane and Barry Hall for Sydney. With his knee constantly tested, Hall proved his fitness. He has got it. Luckily for the Lions, Brown was dominating down the other end. It's a miracle goal. Instant reply. His strength just too great to contain. But it was the same with Hall. He easily brushed off Merritt on his way to a milestone. Goal number 500 for Barry Hall. When Brown wasn't kicking them, he was setting them up. This one for Begley, who put through his first AFL goal. But O'Keefe was able to keep Sydney in front at half-time. It was a tight contest in every aspect of the game. McGrath lucky to squeeze this one past the post. But the game finished as it began in the hands of O'Loughlin. He added two more goals in the final term to give the Swans a hard-fought win. West Coast Michael Braun may be fined by the AFL after a slip-up following the Eagles' win over Fremantle. Braun's blunder came during an acceptance speech for Best on Ground. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, thank the fans, uh, sick and boys, through the rough times and uh, all the best to uh, all the boys and uh, let's have a good year. The Eagles inflicted Fremantle's third straight loss while Nick Revolt booted four as the Saints outclassed the Western Bulldogs by 50 points. 
So with just one game still in progress, the reigning Premiers are the last unbeaten team. Nine sides have two wins, including both the Crows and the Power, and at least three sides will go into the fourth round without a victory. In local football, Wooden Spoon favourite Sturt have made it two from two with a 26-point win over Glenelg. The Tigers led early but couldn't maintain their momentum. North cruised to a 12-goal win over West at Prospect, while Port Adelaide crushed the Premiers at Woodville by 52 points. Clive Waterhouse returned to the Magpies, filling the shoes of Warren Treadray. And like Treaders, the week before, booted seven goals in a commanding performance up forward. So Central, Port and Sturt all have two wins to start the season with. The Eagles and North both a game behind Nord, and Glenelg have played one and lost one. West and South are both none from two. Manchester United is through to the FA Cup final after a 4-1 win over Watford. The Red Devils await the winner of tonight's other semi-final between Blackburn and Chelsea. It was the Premiership's top versus bottom, and it took just seven minutes for Wayne Rooney to put Watford in its place. Hamo Buatza produced a spectacular equaliser to bring the Hornets back on terms, but the Red Devils couldn't be held. Goals to Ronaldo and a second to Rooney, ensuring their safe passage through to a third final in four years. In the Premiership, Sheffield United have condemned West Ham to the brink of relegation with a 3-0 thrashing at Bramall Lane. Michael Tonga's first half free kick decorated with two more second half strikes. Elsewhere, there were wins for Arsenal, Aston Villa, Portsmouth and Reading. Liverpool was held to a goalless draw at Manchester City. New Zealand has stunned South Africa with a five-wicket win in the World Cup that leaves the Proteus semi-final aspirations in doubt. The Black Caps held South Africa to just 193 on a slowish wicket. Scott Styris and Craig McMillan knocking off the total. South Africa meets England on Tuesday, with a loser in danger of missing the finals. And none of the three equal favourites managed to finish a dramatic Grand National at Aintree. 33 to 1 long shot Silver Birch holding off McKelvey in a thrilling finish over the four and a half miles. Dion Heyman, National 9 News. George, that's our sport, and I'm not even going to mention the showdown no, results. I know you're dying to, but OK, we'll move on. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mark. Our unbelievable Indian summer is showing no sign of letting up, and neither does Xavier. He's here with his Sunday night report coming up next. But first, of course, the speed cameras for you. Reminder of these speed camera locations on 5AA tomorrow morning. I put him down as one of the great newsreaders of Australia. Such a generous man in all respects. And the funniest person. I mean, he had the quickest wit. He set the benchmark for newsreading in South Australia. That's tonight, 6.30 on 9. And that's National 9 News. Good night. Dare's doing enough to win tonight. So far, so good for our champion. Monday, he faces his toughest challenge yet. Malcolm. Malcolm. Malcolm, or oh, you're on fire. High pressure temptation. Monday, 7 o'clock. Channel 9. Hi, babe. Got your message. I'll pick you up. See you soon. I got a girlfriend. She's so true. And no other kind of girl will do. But she'll always be good to me. Always be good to me. Always be good to me. Australia's first five-year warranty with unlimited kilometres, there's no stopping the all-new Hyundai Elantra. My day for family, my day for friends, my day for good times that never end. Brad walks out on Ange and takes Shiloh. Gorgeous pics of Tori Spelling's baby boy. Courtney's marriage crisis over David's wild night. Terrorist threat, Prince Christian in danger. Plus, free two-week pass at Fernwood Women's Health Club. It's all in this week's Women's Day. It's my number one celebrity magazine. Women's Day. The lifestyle DVD-based home entertainment system from Bose. So intelligent that it adapts its performance to any environment, stores your CDs, learns your music preferences, responds to your mood, and controls music throughout your entire home. Expand the music you enjoy in up to 14 additional rooms, both indoors and out. Listen to what you want, where you want. It's time to expect more from home theatre. Blackwood Sound, the home of Bose in Adelaide. Remember the things we really love? 
Running under sprinklers and getting soaked. <laughs> Receiving mail, handwritten. <laughs> Catching tadpoles in a pond. Climbing a tree that's been there forever. What we love today, we want to love tomorrow. That's why at Origin, we're working towards a sustainable future for all Australians. At Modern Form Furniture Warehouse, the word is now. Sleek, versatile, fresh, very now. If it's here, it's yours, now. Take it home or we'll deliver it, now. Modern Form Furniture Warehouse. Sanitarium are committed to helping every Aussie grow up healthy, happy and full of whole grain goodness. So we've asked Coles to bring you super specials on selected Sanitarium cereals. Hurry, this week only. Unmissable viewing. I'm not interested in coaching at the Melbourne Footy Club, nor any other club. Did you yeah. really say that Essendon could finish top four this year? Yes. I think Ooh. Kerr is the number one player in the competition. Ooh. Footy Classified, Monday, 10.35. Channel 9. Good evening, folks. A pleasant week ahead, although you will have to have some patience for any sign of moisture. So far, temperature-wise, 22.3 this afternoon after 12.8 this morning. Currently in the city, 19.6. Mount Lofty with 11.9 degrees. Humidity at 57%. Having a look at the chart, the high moving out and down towards Mount Gambier. We've got a southwest to southeast airstream coming through. A bit of moisture on that, some early drizzle around the lower southeast. For the rest of the state, early fog from... Keith and Narracourt back through to Port Augusta. The rest of the state fine, although northerly is ahead of a southwesterly change in the far west. That might just slip away. We'll see how it goes for the rest of the week. As for other areas, it is wet in Darwin, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. Maximum ranging from 16 in Hobart to 33 in Darwin and the Alice. Our forecast again quickly, morning fog through the agricultural areas, early drizzle about the lower southeast and the southwest to southeasterlies turning northerly out through the west ahead of a southwest change over the western coasts later. Strong wind warning, therefore, for the far west, west coast, south central and Neptune Island. Country temperatures, Sejuna looking for a top of 34, clear down to 9 overnight, top of 27 with Murray Bridge at 28. Elsewhere in the state, 26 the top for Narracourt, Victor Harbour looking for 25. On the waters, east to northeast winds by morning at 10 knots, variable by the afternoon, easing back to 8 knots, seas very calm at half a metre and for the metropolitan area it'll be fine warm enough though 28 for both adelaide and elizabeth mount barker eight ish overnight with a top of 26 no longer pleasant in both ways with 26 degrees as the week ahead occurs we do see it slightly warming up once the change moves through we do see the temperature drop back slightly a bit of cloud build up at this stage no moisture in sight though until maybe late saturday into sunday enjoy your week Thank you, Zave, and our thanks to you for your company tonight. And stay with Nine Up for a very special presentation, a one-hour tribute to our much-loved Kevin Crease. Good night. I wish Channel Nine every success, and I wish you, listeners, good viewing. 1959. A simple square box forever changed the way South Australians see the world. The capital city of Australia has been. Hosted suddenly, news was real. History was being made before our eyes. Now we could see what was really happening, hear what was really said. We could form our own opinion. Since that landmark event, Channel 9 has forged a bold new era for a world of greater understanding. Building on the past and working to the future. Share the spirit of South Australia on National 9 News. Well, the old promo says it all, doesn't it? News has been an essential part of our South Australian television diet ever since NWS 9 became the first TV station to officially broadcast images into our living rooms on September the 5th, 1959. Of course, Creasy, Kevin John Creese, was there. In fact, his was the first face on our TV screens when he compared Nine's first full test transmission program, Clarkson's TV Hostess Quest, about two months earlier. G'day, Keith Conlon here in Studio One at Channel 9 in Tint Street, North Adelaide. It's been a sad time for all of us here, as I know it has been for many of you at home, judging by the tidal wave of letters and phone calls received here at the station. But it's also been a time to reflect on the life of a man who truly deserves that much bandied about epithet, Icon. Because Kevin Creese truly was a legend of South Australian television. 
And tonight we'll take you back over the life and times of a man who will long be remembered as the face of South Australia. It seems a long way in time, if not distance, from the lights and cameras of Nine's news studio to the quiet and relaxed pace of Semaphore Road. But this was Creasy's patch as a working class kid growing up in wartime Adelaide. A few years back, the postcards team took Kevin back to his old haunts and we're so glad we did because, as you'll see, you can take the boy out of Semaphore, but you can't take Semaphore out of the boy. So you would have spent a bit of time out here. Oh, I spent years on this jetty. Of course, <laughs> you had to spend years on it because it was twice as long as it is now, or just about twice as long, so it took forever to go out to the end, yeah. uh, to the kiosk, and yeah. come back again. The so, kiosk. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was a huge building, really, a double-storey building, and you used to have dancers out there and all this sort of thing, and everyone said one day, one day, a storm will get that kiosk and well, take it away. Well, somebody lived out there. The Mills family lived out there for a long time. Yeah. In fact, there was one storm where they got marooned out there because part of the jetty back here was blown away. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to get messages to the Mills family by writing them, wrapping them up in a rock and throwing them over the gap in the jetty. Before they saved them. Before they saved them. <laughs> but a year after the biggest storm, would you believe, I came home from school one day, got off the bus, and a mate was waiting for me, and he said, quick, 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 come with me, come with me. We raced down here. Would you believe the kiosk was on fire? It burnt down. It burnt down. <laughs> and there was just a little two-inch pipe that used to run out along this jetty. No pressure in it. They couldn't put the fire out. They had to stand there and watch it burn down. Obviously, Creasy was a natural storyteller. The training for future live-to-air television performances began when he was a young teenager performing at carnivals in post-war semaphore. This is uh, Kevin Crease country. <laughs> I don't know about that. It certainly was the home of the Semaphore Illuminated Carnival for many, many years. Over Christmas and the New Year, they put up coloured lights all over here. There's a bandstand just here, and that's where I used to do it. I did 30 shows in 30 nights, I remember, on one occasion. What do you mean you did 30 shows? Well, we used to have a concert every night. I mean, these were tough times for people. It was just after the Second World War. In the middle of summer, they'd get out of it. It was really hot. There was no air conditioning, no insulation. So if it was a hot night, you got out of the house. You came down here, and there used to be kind of a different situation here where people could sit down, and we'd put on these free shows for them. 
Sometimes it was the same old acts. I had one joke. I used to tell the same joke every night. What was the joke? Oh, no. oh, come on, come on. <laughs> it's a typical Port Adelaide joke. <laughs> it was about the guy who got a job as a night watchman over on the wharves. And one night he's sitting there, his first night on the job, and he hears rumble, 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 and the fella appears out of the darkness with this wheelbarrow. He said, what are you doing? He says, none of your business. He said, what do you got in that wheelbarrow? He said, straw. He said, not against the law. He said, oh, all right. A few minutes later, that fella comes out of the darkness again. This happens about three or four times. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, our friend's in the pub over at the Colac, Port Adelaide there. And he sees the guy who he'd, he'd met that night. And he said, listen, I haven't got that job anymore. I'm not a security guy anymore, so it's no skin off my nose. But you were pinching something that night, weren't you? And then the guy said, of course I was. He said, what are you pinching? He said, wheelbarrows. <laughs> I used to tell that joke almost every night. And the crowd here, <laughs> when I got to the punchline, I'd say, what were you pinching? They'd all yell out, wheelbarrows! <laughs> <laughs> By October of 1959, the lad from the port would be delivering the punchlines to a massive South Australian audience via this strange new fandangled contraption called television. You like a snack that's quick and easy to prepare, then reach for a four-ounce can of Kiora TV snacks. Yes, maybe you fancy Kiora's delicious golden baked beans. Perhaps you prefer your beans with a real barbecued flavour. Then try Kiora barbecued beans. If you're fond of spaghetti, then this is for you, Kiora spaghetti. Why not try your spaghetti with an outdoor flavour? Make it Kiora barbecued spaghetti. Like a little curry to spark up the appetite. Then open a can of Kiora curried spaghetti. Or you can buy delicious, wonderful Kiora curried beans. And ladies, here's big news. All this week, you can buy Kiora TV snacks at a special savings price at Cole stores. Yes, it's a super special. Four ounce cans of Kiora TV snacks at all Cole stores. So buy a big tomorrow. Yes, the live ads on the legendary Adelaide Tonight program. A little different, uh, a little dated. Well, that's because they are. All this goes back nearly 50 years. Back to September the 5th, 1959. It was Creasy who ushered in the then Premier Tom Playford into the studios to officially open NWS 9. I wish the station every success and I wish you listeners good viewing. Yes, listeners. You can see Tom Playford certainly was from the old school when radio was king. And many of the first on-air performers like Kevin Creese made the transition from local stations. Creasy came from 5DN, others like Lionel Williams moved over from 5KA to try their hand at what would become the dominant force in the entertainment industry. Lionel and Creasy became a potent force on local television and their early radio experience working in theatres and halls certainly paid off. But they, like the management team and the technicians, were novices to this new game in town. Nine o'clock in the morning, it, it, helping the camera guys to learn their craft. Then we were uh, practicing reading idiot sheets, practicing doing interviews. In the afternoon, um, Kevin and I put on a T-shirt and, and, and we were Woody Woodruff show in the early stages. And one of the first things, of course, we insisted on doing was having talent quests. So we had auditions and we found Ian Fairweather, thank goodness. So Ian came in and ended up doing the kiddies program. With momentum building, all seemed in readiness for the launch date of September the 5th. But sadly, as the race to be first on air grew ever more frantic, one of General Manager Bill Davies' first tasks was to inspect the fire-damaged remains of the station's new studio. Well, it was a dreaded fire, all right, but we didn't know what it was. We didn't know what had happened until 4 o'clock in the morning. Faced with such a major disaster, the station staff, ever mindful of that rapidly approaching launch date, decided to do what would come naturally to performers like Creasy and all the rest. They improvised. Well, we were at the ladies' dressing room. <laughs> Where else could we go? <laughs> there weren't any other rooms to go to, that was the point. So, uh, yes, the first things were done, the first live things were done in the girls' dressing room. For Kevin, today's makeup area, just metres from the old ladies' dressing room, would always bring back memories, especially as he would be the man thrown in at the deep end, so to speak. The first face on our South Australian television screens. Yes, we weren't going to be stopped. Um, kind of like this. <laughs> and and uh, so we set up a camera and a few, few chairs and things in the, women, what was with the women's dressing room. And that was our first studio, and I interviewed uh, four charming ladies, and we had a bit of a contest as to who won that. 
and then the rest of the night we were showing uh, movies and things and I'd never seen television and I remember sitting in this women's dressing room with this little monitor TV set in front of me and the picture I didn't understand at the time but the thing wasn't working properly and the picture kept rolling like this sort of thing and I thought what have I got myself into I should get back into radio this is never going to catch on <laughs> But it did, of course. And soon, a flurry of programs were in full swing, from the Channel Niners to Adelaide Tonight. And in the early days, Kevin Kreese featured in nearly all of them. Right now, it's time for the Channel 9 Ballet, and they've put together tonight a very charming little piece. It's a real pretty one. Lionel Williams and Kevin Kreese cut their teeth in Studio One, bouncing off each other's anarchic magic. Neither presenter could have foreseen the chemistry that would develop over coming years on the set of Adelaide Tonight. But Lionel remembers heading off with station management before Channel 9 had commenced broadcasting to spy on a potential TV recruit who developed quite a reputation as a spruker at John Martin's department store. The executives and Lionel watched him discreetly. And they just stood up the back behind a pylon and said, yeah, let's have a look at this kid because he, by all reports he was okay. And we saw him, and, you know, almost instantly, you know when you look at talent, it only takes you about two minutes. They've either got it or they haven't. And, you know, we were of an accord. Uh, he was the guy we wanted. You're interested in bowling too, by the way, aren't you? Well, I The gang-making I... programs at Channel 9 were as susceptible to new fads as the rest of the community, and soon they'd worked their way into Adelaide Tonight's schedule. Like the day, a fresh-faced and somewhat sheepish Kevin Kreese got the Duke of Bedford to strut his stuff on the dance floor of Studio One. Well, it's not a trick. I should not... Well, I don't know. It's not a trick from our end. It seems that we have had a phone call from your wife, the Duchess. What she... What dirt she done on me? <laughs> well, she is requesting that you show the people of Adelaide, besides showing them the art treasures you've brought with you, she's also requesting to show them how you do the twist. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, where do I do that? Would you, for us, if we could find a twist record and a uh, and lovely oh, partner. Oh, no. Wait till I see my wife. <laughs> Would you? Sure, I don't mind. Well, let's move the table. All right, move the table out of the way. And, uh... How big is your twist? Mine's very limited. <laughs> well, I'll follow you. You'll follow me. Studio One here was home to Adelaide tonight, and for those of us lucky enough to be part of it, this was where it was all happening. Now, it's hard to imagine 90 minutes of live television four days a week coming out of here, but that is what happened. And Creasy was a part of it from the very beginning. As you'd imagine, not everything went according to plan. Hi, you at home there. I hope you're going to enjoy everything that happens. Do you notice that with the advent of spring, we seem to get a pile of bird songs? Tonight is no exception. Have you noticed that? You have? Good. Because Mildy Burke is here to sing for us. Bye bye, Blackbird. Adagol and Milda. Thankfully, the audience were a forgiving lot as homegrown talent was beamed into their lounge rooms. But the 10th Street audience and those at home must have sometimes wondered where the fantasy of Chelly left off and the reality of a major front-page debacle set in. How many of those skits went to plan? None. None. <laughs> were they oh, there was a script, you mean? <laughs> well... Do you remember the one where he had the plate with the, the cream pie on Jerry Gibson's face and it was towards the end of the, of the skit that he had to just do the, the plate full in Jerry's face? Yeah. Well, 
the guys at the back had put the pie, which was filled with shaving cream, not ordinary clean, cream, no. on a paper, on a not a paper plate, but on a, a, a china plate. A real plate? Yeah, a real plate. Bang into Jerry's face, and as he did it, the plate broke, <gasps> and then Jerry's forehead opened up, the, like the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and well, Creasy knew he'd killed him. But no, we finished that script. Let me tell you, we got that script. Well, well this is like television. Yes, it was. <laughs> we had nothing that we... Uh, we just finished it. And then quietly they just took Jerry off to the hospital. And live telly provided a few dramas for the kids as well. Like the day the legendary Bobo the Clown startled the Littleys in the Channel 9 studios with a performance that was anything but routine. He used to have a little blue nose, which was stuck on. It was actually a table tennis ball with a hole cut in it. And he had trouble getting glue that didn't make him sneeze. And well, on one occasion, he'd run out of the glue that didn't make him sneeze, but he used to speak to every child in that audience every day. He was wonderful like that. He used to work so hard. So he's in the audience and saying, Hello, and what's your name? What, what'd you say? I flew, and his nose flew off. And the poor child. Oh, oh, his nose just came off. And so we thought, we've got to do something about this, but we couldn't get anything by the next day. He couldn't get the other glue by the next day. So he went back in there again with the nose firmly glued on and went up and said, Hello, I'm Bobo, what's your name? And he said, Oh, oh, oh. But he put his finger on his nose and sneezed and his teeth flew out. <laughs> Many dramas on set were part of the course in the hurly-burly of live telly. There was a touch of old vaudeville about the early days of Adelaide tonight Performers were often pushing the bounds, and in Creasy's case, sometimes a little too far for the management. The, the most extraordinary thing that Kevin has ever done, and somebody said to me this only a um, couple of days ago, which uh, people's memories are quite incredible, was when he was doing, I think it was a Kiora commercial, and you were dressed up as a cowboy, and you had a cowboy hat on, with a toggle thing oh. up under your chin, and it was swinging under your yeah. chin, and you oh, were down... In the soup. With your soup, and you said, don't let your doodle dangle in the soup. That's right. <laughs> We were nearly, you know, you got banned for we that. Were nearly, no, we were nearly fired for that. That made headlines all throughout Australia. Yeah. Kevin Crease at his doodle in his suit. Dangled his doodle. <laughs> yeah. that, that was headline. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. Oh, in those days. That was before you came along. <laughs> Suspensions, docking of pay, Kevin Crease took it all in his stride. And he was soon back doing what he did best, hamming it up for the crowd. Go away and play in tomorrow's flats. Don't go away. Don't go away. Oh? No, I'll clear this up for you. Thank you very much. That's yeah. all right. I'll just take that over here. You know, Ian's back on the children's session tomorrow. Oh, yeah, how are things going in the kiddie session? Fine, fine. Funny, after the show today, went out, out just outside the studio here, and a little, a little girl came up to me. Got so high. And she said, uh, Kevin? And I said, yes. She said, you know something? I said, what? She said, I've got five brothers and five sisters. Oh, and I said, yeah. gee, that's, that's, that's really lovely. Gee, it must take a, a lot of money to have a family like that. She said, oh. We don't buy them, we raise them. <laughs> it's a cold, hard beast, the television camera. You look into the blackness of that camera lens and you project to an audience of thousands. How's it done? Well, it's a craft learned and refined by people who work on television. But then, very occasionally, along comes a Kevin Crease. Like a champion in any field, he made it look all so easy. How did he do it? Well, for part of the answer, we have to go back to his youth. Raised around Semaphore and the port, the young Kevin Crease developed the common touch as he mingled with the locals in this proudly working class area. When we took him back to his old stamping ground for a postcard story, his recollections of early events and his ability to spin a yarn about them had us all captivated. There was the one, for instance, about how the old Jervois Bridge would get stuck, leaving the young semaphore schoolboy hot and hassled. Well, you'd be coming home from school on the trolley bus on a very hot day, and the bridge would have been swung open to let a ship through. Yep. But the bridge used to then expand and wouldn't shut properly. Basic law of physics. Yes. <laughs> so you'd be stuck on your trolley bus on that side when all you wanted to do was to get on that side so you could go home, put your togs on and jump in the water. Well, there's a picture of it. It used to obviously really wouldn't even get close to shut. No. And how, did they, how, how did they fix it? They used to get the fire brigade. They did. It doesn't sound like it's true, does it? But they did. They used to get the fire brigade to come and squirt the bridge yeah. to cool it down so it would contract enough to close. Oh, and we could climb back on the trolley bus and we'd go home. 
As we strolled around his patch, Creasy's real knowledge of his own backyard became even more obvious, with the local landmarks triggering a flood of memories and an attention to facts and detail that would stand him in good stead in the years to come. Semaphore, Scarborough. <laughs> that was the original name for this area here. Until along came a guy called George Coppin, yeah. who had unlimited faith in this area. There was nothing here. But over there, he built the Hotel and Marine Thermopolia. What's a Thermopolia? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it means beer garden in old language. But he did that, and he built this big, huge flagpole. He had business interests in Port Adelaide. He had, I think he had a hotel there, too. He did, too. Ah. When the sh he'd see the ships coming up the Gulf here, he'd run flags up his flagpole to signal to his business interest in Port Adelaide to get down here and meet the ships, you see? Yes. And so it was a semaphore. And so this area gradually became known as the semaphore because of George Coppin's big flagpole there. Yeah, now he became famous, the father of Australian theatre. He did, he did, and he, he opened, uh, I think it was he who opened the Wonder Graph Open Air Theatre over there. He went broke, actually, after he'd put up his hotel, went off to the Victorian gold fields, entertained the miners, came back, paid off his debts, and then opened, in that same area over there, the first roller skating rink in the Southern Hemisphere. You can see it, can't you? The man loved his roots and the opportunities that the semaphore sideshows and carnival tents provided for a young bloke perfecting his storytelling craft. Down here, it was all about entertaining beachgoers and taking the occasional risk, sometimes a big risk. Now, the sight of all that sand, Kevin, it, uh, it has a special meaning for you. It certainly has, one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. For some reason, rather, at the age of about 16, I think it was, maybe 17, I was, became children's editor of the Sunday Mail. I was possum. I was possum. <laughs> and possum decided he was going to have a big sandcastle competition on Semaphore Beach. Good idea. I don't know where he got the idea, but he did. And so the big day came, and I thought there'd be about, oh, maybe 100, 200 people to turn up. Yep. And as I got down here and stood here, the trains started arriving and the trolley buses started arriving with thousands and thousands of people ready to build, ready to build a sandcastle. And, and it was just a beach covered with seaweed. So I raced down to a contractor who, uh, F.T. and B.I. Thompson, I've never forgotten, banged on the door. And I don't know if it was Mr. F.T. or Mr. B.I. who came to the door, I never knew which was which. And I said, I have a, I'm in real trouble. He said, you're always in trouble, you creases. What's the problem now? I said, I need a lot of sand on the beach and no seaweed. He said, why? So I explained the situation to him. He said, oh, God almighty, all right, get back down there. So by the time I got back down here, there was a, the biggest bulldozer you've ever seen <laughs> clearing this great area. It's about the size of Edinburgh airfield yeah, or something so, like that. So, you know. so is that, that's the end of your problem? Uh, yeah, well, no. <laughs> no, because Marjorie Jackson turned up. Oh. Marjorie Jackson, at that time, of course, was at her peak as an athlete, just came back from the Olympics. She's just won all those gold medals That's right. in Helsinki. And she'd been working on the Sunday Mail as a journalist, you see. And I'd asked her whether she could be my guest of honour at the big sandcastle building competition. You were fond of her. I was very fond of her. <laughs> I, I really was. I was, I was you know. <laughs> Anyhow, Marjorie turned up and said, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, do you want to go for riding the bumper cars? <laughs> and so... She said, well, all right. And so we went for a ride on the bumper cars. And then it was time to come back, and by the time everyone had built the sandcastles, and all the mothers were saying, do we get a prize? I thought, oh, I didn't think about prizes. You didn't have any prizes. Didn't have any prizes. So <laughs> I raced around all the sideshows and said, give me some free tickets, please. Yeah, so thank goodness they knew me. So I got all these free tickets, came back, we put a little table down on the beach, and there were all these voracious mothers and their children saying, where's our prize? And I stood up and made the biggest mistake of my life and said, we've got all these free tickets for you, boys and girls. And the crowd descended. The police had turned up by this time. They took Marjorie by a high their elbow <laughs> and raced her off to a police car and left me on the table with these thousands of people racing towards me. So I took off down along the beach and Again. out ran the lot to Semaphore South. <laughs> That's it. And that was the end of the sandcastle building competition. <laughs> Well, he might not have been king of the kids that day, but a few years later, when Channel 9 broadcast the annual Christmas pantomimes, Creasy, Lionel and the rest of the Nine gang showed how years of experience treading the boards and fronting the fairground crowds all came together at the right time, presenting the classics. A day are you, my man, there are the invitations. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, there are only two invitations here, so only two of you can go in. Well, you see, it's like this. 
My daughter, Ethel, left it home on the whatnot. On the which what? No, not the which what, the whatnot. I don't care which whatnot it was left on. There are only two invitations there, so only two of you can go in. Go, oh, but don't you see? I'm sorry, sir. Only two. Oh, oh, Papa, Maury, come here, quickly. Yes, yes, I yes, have yes. an idea. Yes, Papa, you have one invitation. Maury and I will walk in backwards, and he will think we're coming out. Oh, what an excellent idea. Ethel, you are a lifesaver. How can you tell? By the hole in your head. Ooh. Come on, let's get cracking right. then. Uh, uh, we're, we're just coming, uh, going out. We'll be back in a moment. Yes, very well. Yes. Oh. Well, the pantomime was, uh, I mean, really it was groundbreaking television in this country because I don't believe that television pantomime had been done anywhere else in the country uh, and uh, you know there were a couple that come to mind we did um, Jack and the Beanstalk and uh, and we did Cinderella and Kevin, Kevin played the part of one of the ugly sisters <laughs> thank you for saying I am beautiful you beautiful <laughs> With the face like that. <laughs> and what's wrong with my face? Well, for a start, why don't you wash your face? Hmm? I can see what you had for breakfast. And what did I have for breakfast? Eggs. Well, you're wrong. Huh? That was yesterday morning. Even worse than ah, I suspected. Never Papa, mind. Did you see that? It was all <laughs> hilarious and high rating. And very profitable, too, for Channel 9. And a young Turk who was often in the studios watching the madness of this new money-making medium. We here at Channel 9, where, where we were at the time, uh, was heaven sent uh, to the Murdoch Empire and News Limited because we made packets of dough here uh, that enabled Rupert to, 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 you know, to fund the Australian and those sorts of things. It's funny to think of the Murdoch Empire being born of crazy nights on Adelaide tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I remember, you know, wandering around the studio, Rupert would, would, would come in or he'd bump into you in the, the passageway and say, Mate, how are you going? You know, I liked that bit the other night. Or, you know, that, that was bloody awful. Don't do that again. <laughs> the very nature of television means performers often fly by the seat of their pants. Not that Creasy had any the day he donned a toga with Don Lane, no less, in a construction worker's special Adelaide Tonight prior to the opening of Adelaide's new festival theatre. It was built, of course, as a home for the arts and high culture. Not that anyone seemed to pass that message on to Kevin and Don and not sight nor sound of my ace salesman, Nauseus Creasius. <laughs> Greetings and salutations, O oh useless one. Good morning, Nauseus. Now, I want you to know something. The Emperor Julius Caesar is on the market for a new chariot, so he could be calling in here any time this morning. Not, not Julie. That's right. The yeah. one with the floral tribute on his head. Yeah. So be on thy best behavior. And just remember, let me do the talking. Do you understand? <laughs> Prostrate yourself before the mighty Caesar, protector of the proletariat, convener of the Colosseum, scourge of Windy Point, and emperor of Rome. Hit the dirt. <laughs> Couple of familiar faces. <laughs> what do you want to lose? I don't know. He only wants to kiss the royal ring, Great Caesar. You must be a public servant. Yeah. <laughs> Wrap your north and south around it. <laughs> Semaphore little out. <laughs> Tell me, aren't you the man who gave me a hand to get a dad thing? <laughs> Verily, it was I, your highness, or lowness, oh. as that may be. You know. Take it back, it's got tenure. <laughs> <laughs> consummate professional, but also a very kind man and a decent man, but a very private man as well. For decades, Kevin Creese brought us all the drama of daily political life. The collapse of the state bank, the rise and fall of state governments. 
But at one point in the mid-70s, Creasy was well and truly in the thick of it. In 1975, Creasy stepped away from the glare of the studio lights and the television cameras to support those who served at the top of state government. It was a move that prompted some light-hearted ribbing from his mates on the set of Adelaide Tonight. How are you? I think I'll call you Mr. Crease now because you're going into Parliament. I'm not going into Parliament. You're going to work for the McGarry medalist, Ron Nebo, aren't you? No, no, that's not a fellow. This is no, th no, 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 no. You mean Mr. Kneebone is not Ron Kneebone? No, he's, that's not Mr. No, that's another Mr. Kneebone. I thought it was Ron Kneebone. No, he's the chief secretary. He's a, he's a couple of years older than Ron. And what are you going to do? Couple. You're going to be his uh, PR man? Yes, his press secretary. After all these years? Yeah. What, 14 years in television? Yeah, 1959. 59? Yeah. And then... I, feel, I feel as nervous as Blazer. Why? Oh, I don't know. I, feel, I guess it's just so many years since I've come into this studio and there's been an audience here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm used to sit... We, we record Newsbeat in here, you see, and I sit over there in the middle of nowhere and you have a little pool of light there and the rest of it's all dark and you sit there and say, well now, next we have, yeah. you know. <laughs> hey, look out now, there's thousands of people. What are you going to do uh, in public? Why do, you want, why do you want to quit television and do all that? <clears throat> well, I think 14 years is long enough in one place. 14 what? 14 years. Oh, yeah. And Bill That's Davies right. agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, no, he didn't. No, uh, I think it's long enough. And... Um, I've always, want, I've always been fascinated by politics. I've always been fascinated by government since I was a little kid. My father got me interested in it. And uh, this opportunity came along to kind of work within politics, within a government, you know, and see it working from day to day and see how the decisions are made and why they're made and all the pressures and so forth. Well, what would happen if you, if you go with the Chief Secretary, Mr. Nebo, and yeah. then the next election of Labor gets a boot? What happens to you then? I'll come back here if I'll take oh. me. <laughs> <laughs> I always come back here. Later, Kevin would become Premier Don Dunstan's press secretary at a time when the flamboyant leader was at the height of his powers. The move into the political arena would only last a couple of years, and then the consummate newsman was back on our screens, this time working around the corner from Tin Street at the nearby studios of Channel 7 when they were located in Strangways Terrace, North Adelaide. Years later, those heady days in the cut and thrust of state politics would come to the fore as Kevin Creese recounted his political experiences at the time of Don Dunstan's funeral. Well, what a remarkable and unique occasion. Uh, I had the pleasure to work for Don Dunstan for three years, and certainly in the final part of this tribute that has been paid to him today, in particular by the members of his family, uh, he was here once again with the, with the sentences and the feelings we experience so often, particularly question your assumptions, which is one I'll remember the rest of my life. Good evening. The fairy tale has been completed for Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson. Kevin Crease really earned his reputation as the icon of Adelaide TV news. Ten years at seven, and then the last 20 years here at nine, in a unique partnership with fellow newsreader Rob Kelvin. Kevin has brought us the good news and the bad news the constant stream of stories that shape our state's progress and the unthinkable events that shake our world view. Tonight, the world is trying to come to terms with the almost unbelievable events of the past 19 hours. It was a calculated, ruthless and brutal attack on the heart of America, the tall twin towers of New York's World Trade Center, now little more than rubble, after two hijacked passenger jets crashed into the massive skyscrapers. It was Creasy who told us about the moon landing, bringing astounding pictures into our living rooms to prove it. And since those dramatic days, news technology has been forever changing, as Kevin and Rob Kirwan know only too well. A few years back, the two newsmen were reminiscing in Studio Two about the big news events, like the Kennedy assassination and its aftermath. I think the first really dramatic vision that we ever got was, of course, a couple of days, a few days later, when um, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was shot, mm -hmm. because unlike the assassination, where you didn't really see anything until the Zabruder film, so so much later, uh, with Lee Harvey Oswald, you saw Jack Ruby step forward, and bang! And I'm, I, in my mind, it was the most dramatic thing. How how long was that? Was that the same day? Oh no, that was days later again, sort of thing. It, it, everything took so long, and and the what used to happen was, of course, say they were in New York or somewhere like that, or Washington there'd be an original picture of whatever had happened, but then that was developed and then uh, copied how many times 
couple of hundred times probably. And sent by plane. Sent by plane. It would eventually lob in Sydney and of course all the stations in the network in Australia wanted a copy of it. So they'd make all further copies of whatever it was. And then eventually you'd get your copy. Mm. It was a pretty, a pretty big mess by the time you but got it. You compare that with the immediacy of today like the Gulf War last year. When uh, we followed the action we saw the very first bombs to hit Baghdad. Mm. Bang, they were there live on television. Yeah. One of, our, one of our fellows here tells the story uh, of how he was um, on a ship in the Gulf and what they would do was see the missiles fired from the ship they were on. It was a destroyer or something like that. Then they would race down below and look at the television, see the missiles landing. Now that is how it's changed. These two blokes have seen so many changes. After all, they've been a two-man tag team wrestling with local and world events for 20 years. It's a partnership neither of them could foresee. Well, what about day one? It was interesting. It was interesting because um, I think we both looked at each other and said, um, this ain't going to work. <laughs> and that was 20 years ago. Well, why um, wasn't it going to work? Oh, two blokes. Why would you have two, why would you have two men on a, on a news... Uh, desk. But the two-man combo set records for ratings and longevity and perhaps that can be explained by a very simple chemistry. Over the years we started talking and talking and talking and um, we liked each other. Yeah we liked each other and um, I've been very very sad this week. For the gang who'd worked with Kevin Crease in the early days of variety television, the move to news made infinite sense because it was a means of ensuring a long career in what can be a very fickle business. I think it's an overused word icon and I try and avoid it if I can, but he was truly it because he was in television longer than any of us because he was able to subtly make changes. Now, you can't be a pretty head and be a compere forever and a day, but you can be a very, very good newsreader forever and a day. This newsreading caper seems like a very serious business, and of course most of the time it is, but as Anne Wills, the one-time Channel 9 weather presenter, recalls, working with Creasy on the news set could be anything but. But one time I had a pair of earrings on as I would have, of course. but they were three bells and they were tink, 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 and the audio guy said, lose the earrings or lose the job. Well, you just said yes. You know, so the earrings, I put them down on the side of Creasy's desk. I started doing the weather and I looked out of the side of my, my set because Creasy was, his, his desk was right next door to my set. And there he was with my earrings hanging out of his nostrils. I had to have them disinfected at least <laughs> three weeks. You know. I broke up, I spat all over the weather map, couldn't write on it, couldn't do anything. It was a glass map in those days, you know. And, and so he was very happy because he had actually broken me. He said, Wills, he's broke, yes, you know. And gotcha. I said, Creasy's transition from variety television to the more serious side of news and current affairs was a gradual one, starting with a Saturday morning breakfast interview and chat show, and then later moving to the more hard-hitting approach of Newsbeat. From the news division of Channel 9, this is Newsbeat. Good evening and welcome to Newsbeat. Tonight's a special night with a 50th birthday to be celebrated. A half a century ago, the news first hit the streets of Adelaide. And first but up in Newsbeat regardless of the style or format, the, the same the fundamentals applied, communicating in a very personal way with the audience. A lot of people have the mistaken idea that television is thousands of people watching. Now you know and I know that that's not true. Television is mum and dad and maybe two children or two and a half children. And if you can hold them absorbed in their lounge room or their kitchen or their bedroom or wherever they've got a television set, you're just chatting to them. You're not having to speak up in a big showy manner so that thousands at an outdoor venue can hear what you're doing and saying. What you're doing is talking to mum and dad at home. Now, Kevin had that great skill. Now, trust is something that's hard to... You can't buy it, 
you earn it. And how do you earn it? You earn it through, I think, credibility over a long period of time and stability. And Kevin was a constant in so many people's lives in this state, certainly in my generation and your generation, because, you know, we grew up watching him and then he was at constantly. He had a couple of years where he went away and he was with Don Dunstan for a while and being his press secretary, but he was on television in one form or another, another, basically throughout our whole lives. So that was our constant and we trusted him. And it's a little bit like, you know, the great American Walter Cronkite, um, you know, Brian Henderson in, in New South Wales, but Kevin Creese was somebody that, if Creasy told you something, then, um, then you believed it. There was Creasy, and then there was a lot of space. You know, there, there's just a, a big gap. There was no one like him. And I was conscious for two decades that I was working with a legend in, the, in this industry. And I look at news services from around the world, there's no one like him. He, um, Rob Kelvin said to me early on, he said, you know, Creasy could read the back of the bus ticket and it would be bloody interesting. And he was right, and I think that really summed him up. He was so unique and he just had such a gift and such a talent. Some of those people that are like that won't share and aren't as generous, but he had that as well. He just wanted to impart it. So he was one part storyteller, great raconteur, and one part a teacher. And um, it's very rare you get, I think, both of those working so beautifully in one person. How true. To straddle six decades in the media game, you also need a bit of luck. And Creasy had that too, especially when he did the unthinkable during one bulletin. Now, as it happens, in the very early days, radio messages from local cabbies would occasionally interfere with Nine's transmissions. It was a godsend for Kevin Creese. One time he said a naughty four-letter word, I'm reading because he dropped his script, reading the news, and he just kept going, as he did because he was a consummate professional, as you know. And no one ever knew things were sort of uh, not running as smooth as they should do. And the next thing, they rang up the switchboard and said, you know what, the taxi radio, somebody swore on the taxi radio and it came out over the telly. Because <laughs> Creasy wouldn't have done it. <laughs> you know, I mean, isn't that a, isn't that a great tribute to, to Creasy that, you know, well, I don't think he ever did swear, did he? No. Not me. Yes, Creasy was one of few to get away with dropping a four-letter word on the box. And perhaps that's because his news reading seemed so effortless. Keith, under pressure, he had poise. Good timing, never rushed. And when the heat's on, I've always thought that's the best way to go. You, you just take your time, you're clear, you're concise. You stay clear in your head and clear in your speech. And Kevin was so good at that. And so many times on the news set, either the auto cue wouldn't work or, you know, that thing that hits the fan hits the fan and all breaks loose in the control room and it's all coming through his earpiece. But no, nah, he, um, he'd just stay steady he knew what he was doing. Tell you the other thing he taught me. If you know a little bit more than the script, you've got a chance. In other words, if you know beyond the auto cue, you know beyond what you're introducing, you've got a bit of depth and a bit of knowledge, then you've got a good chance of being able to relay that to the people that are watching at home. And uh, that was one of his gifts. And another was his capacity to pick up on a turn of phrase or a script line that just didn't sound right. Good evening. A woman is recovering in hospital after falling from her bike into the Port River near the lighthouse late today. Police divers have recovered her bicycle. <laughs> what about her? <laughs> they recovered her? So this one didn't get to air. Instead, it was back to the subs for a quick makeover before bulletin time. It was an attention to detail that served him well right up to the very last bulletin, a little more than two months ago. Right now, it's back to the cricket. Good night. While he's touched all of our lives with his nightly appearances on our lounge room TV screens, Kevin Creese's impact behind the scenes has been no less profound. A whole lot of people who've entertained and informed us over the years owe much to the quiet observer and teacher. And I'll never forget, um, it was when Sandy Roberts left to go to Melbourne from Adelaide, and Kevin rang my parents at home in Ferriton Park, Betty and Roy, and told them that he was thrilled that he'd be working with me and that I had a future. And um, it was one of the happiest phone calls I reckon my mother, bless her heart, took in her life. And uh, mum being a, a Port Adelaide girl and Kevin being a local fella in many ways. So um, right from the start, he gave me some confidence. And uh, I was just thrilled to be part of his team. And uh, here he was embracing me and taking me on. So um, it was a ma magic time for me in, in, in the media. Was he, were you, um you know, was it a bit daunting to be sit, sit, sitting next to the bloke you've admired since you were a kid? 
it was daunting. I mean, here you are, you're sitting next to a bloke who's a bit of a hero and, and somebody that, you know, is larger than life. And my ability at that stage was to, you know, be able to call a few dogs, trots and races. And, and here I am sitting to the bloke that was the first face on television. So it was a bit daunting. But as I said, he, he gave you confidence. And once I knew he had confidence in me, that made all the difference. Confidence in any pursuit is vital for success, whether it's out on the football field in a pressure game or in front of the cameras on a postcard shoot. Too good not to join in, so here I go. For Port Adelaide player Chad Corns, the transition from footy star to on-air talent has involved a sharp learning curve, but one which over the past few years has been intimately guided by Kevin Creese. I first started the traineeship here in 2002. Uh, Channel 9 and Creasy came straight up and offered to give me um, some advice and media training. So for the last two years, every Tuesday, we'd come into the studio here and, and he'd uh, take me through how to read the news properly and just give advice on, on everything media. So he's been a massive help for me. You're a, a you know, particularly casual coot around the place and people might think, oh, yeah, that's the confident Corns family thing. But tell us, you, I mean, you, you weren't that keen to get your face on the telly, were you? No, every time I got in front of a camera, I used to be shaking and sweating up and just so, so nervous. And it wasn't until, well, even now, I still get a little bit nervous, but Creasy's helped me out so much in that regard. Uh, two years media training with him, I probably took it for granted, you know. Yeah. Didn't realise how much of a legend he is in, in Australian media and to be taught by him for, for that long was um, such a great honour and, yeah, I owe a lot to him. And even in the last days of his life, the mentor was still at work. Only in the last three or four weeks, Keith, I've had a number of conversations about Warren Treadray and Chad Corns with Kevin. And he saw both of those boys as part of his team, as much as being part of the Port Adelaide team, because they were part of Creasy's team at nine. And he was talking to me about how he could make Tread as a better performer on air and what he could do for Chad. So, you know, 25 years ago, he was doing it for me. And in the last four or five weeks, even though he was gravely ill and in great pain on many days he was still thinking about how Treaders and Chad could be even better performers on air for his team. Up until two weeks ago he was giving me tips and clues and ideas and suggestions. He was still sending me a text message after the news saying why don't you try this. So it was never, it, it was just always pearls of wisdom that you'd rapidly soak up as they as they rolled across from, uh, from Creasy to all of us and um, some of the major lessons I learnt from him like breathing and not just reading the news but telling it just it sounds easy to do but that that's one of the hardest things to be able to tell the news to imagine that you're talking to your mom or a friend and he taught me those little tricks of the trade he taught me funny things like how to stop myself laughing i'm a chronic giggler oh now how, what's the <laughs> trick there it, it's actually quite a painful trick you put your fingernail right under the cuticle of your thumb like that Ooh. and when you press it really hard it actually takes your mind off pretty well anything else because the pain is so severe and he said if you do this you'll be able to pull yourself back together whether you're laughing or you know giggling or whatever because i'm a bit like that <laughs> <laughs> Those old footy promotions featuring the early Adelaide Tonight Gang are sure proof that Creasy and his mate Lionel Williams were simply never going to be picked up by the Port Adelaide Magpies. But a shoot like this would have been one of the quietly savoured joys for Kevin Creese, the boy from the port. His very vocal passion for the Maggies and the power was the bane of many a newsroom colleague over many years. Creasy and Port Adelaide. Look, he loved the club and he... he and the buggers kept on winning for years and years, the Magpies, and then, of course, the power with their premiership in 2004. But they were also symbolic and representative of the area that he grew up in. So for him, they transcended just a football team. They, they were part of that semaphore Port LA culture. And, you know, Kevin was born in North LA, but it was in, at semaphore that he grew up, and it was at semaphore that he had these wonderful summers that he'd spend at the semaphore sideshows. And that's where he, in many ways, learned to think on his feet and to become a spruker. His passion for his team and the importance of the community he came from never waned. Even in the very last days of his life, like a couple of weeks ago, when he was still geeing up one of his most recent protégés for the match against Frio. I think he forgot the, the time difference and uh, he rang me, it was about six o'clock over there, so he's woken me up and <laughs> he just uh, told me how much he wanted, wanted us to win this game and how much of a challenge it's going to be. So 
he sounded really fired up, the most fired up I'd, I'd heard him for a while. And he said, you win by 14 points. And I think we won by 12 or 13 and text me straight after the game. Hey, I said, I said 14, <laughs> not 12, so. On Saturday, the Port Adelaide Footy Club did battle with their arch foes, the Adelaide Crows. But this time, the armbands weren't for some legendary player or official from the past but a true believer nonetheless. Kevin Kreese, the man who was for so long the public heart and face of South Australian television, was a private person. He was in our homes every week, but he shunned the spotlight when it came to the A-list public gatherings. Seven Network sports guru Bruce McAvaney saw his old mate several times in his final days. He was overwhelmed by the response, from the public response, um, and we talked about how he would reply to all the letters and, and, and emails, and he was worried that he wouldn't be able to get back to people. But he, he connected with a lot of people that had been part of his life that he hadn't seen for a while, and he got great joy out of that. And the real thing that has um, sustained Kevin for more than 20 years is Tommy's son. It was a relationship that would keep the 70-year-old newsreader and dad forever young. The oldest roadie on tour with his son Tom's band, Frenzel Rob. For a little love song, it's called Punch in the Face. Kevin, um, his one wish was that, you know, Tom and he would be closer than close always and, um, that wish has been fulfilled. And um, I've said to Kevin a number of times, Cliff, that for all his greatest accomplishments, and he has so many, his greatest achievement is his, his relationship with his son. And uh, um, I think he agrees with me. I know he does. In the last days of Creasy's life, the man who shared the news desk with him for two decades was there for one last chat. You know, he knew he was in a lot of trouble. But as he faced, he faced that right from the start. But he didn't say it um, sadly or morosely. It was as if it was just a matter of fact. Mm. He's telling you the fact of what he was going through. Mm. Almost like he was reporting it. It was just... He was fascinated by it. He, 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 and of course, as usual, he, he was learning about it. Mm. Uh, that, that hour, I, I, I really think I was privileged to be able to be there and mm. to have a talk in circumstances like that, and I would have really regretted it if I hadn't been able to do it. As Rob and others have confirmed, Kevin Kreese was an intensely private man working in a very public business, and no one knew the business better than him. Kevin Kreese's career straddled six decades, and most of it here at Channel 9. Much of it here in Studio One. So it's from here we say, farewell, Creasy. Mate, you're on. You look ridiculous in the 90s. <laughs> you know what I mean. I'd like to feel cool, really cool. Oh, yeah. Cornell cool. Uh -huh. And that's National 9 News. Have a fabulous and safe Christmas weekend. Right now, here's Tracy. Good night.
but above all, a newsman who set the standard we all aspire to. From everyone here at 60 Minutes, we share your loss and salute a friend and colleague. He'll be missed by us all. Tonight on 60 Minutes. No, you're not seeing things. Yes, he's for real. In there, teeth and all. Maybe you do have to have an element of craziness. 20 years, eating, sleeping. What I wanted to do was find out about their language from inside their pack. Living with wolves. Ticks, fleas, worms, everything that dogs have had at one stage or another I've had. Confronting our oldest fears. Well done. Excellent. The term big bad wolf comes to mind. Risking his life to save them. I find it very, very frightening. I worry so much for him when he's in there. Sean Ellis really is the wolf man. Do you ever wish you'd been born a wolf? <laughs> a very special delivery. Joshua and Lucas, the Banfield twins. It cost us approximately $300,000. They were born in the USA. Clinical, business-like, excellent, great. A wonderful gift of love. Wow, I did that. I helped these guys. Oh, my God. Thanks to a surrogate mum. It's not about the money. It's very much about helping somebody. Why desperate Aussie couples... I was angry. I felt very hard done by. ...want our cold-hearted laws changed. You'd literally have to rent a womb. Absolutely. The huge price they pay for happiness. One of the proudest moments. Proud, huge moments. Have you got any ideas for the election? What's he really like? This is the time for the revenge of the nerds, right, is come it? Come on, it's about time. <laughs> Certainly, there's no stopping him. You don't care if they think you're a nerd? I couldn't care less. The hot favourite for PM. My mum says that she went on a couple of dates with you. Where do I hide? <laughs> Getting to know the runs. That's, That's where you learn to dance. That's where I learned to dance. In search of the man, w how do you take the mickey out of him? <laughs> Let me count the ways. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the political mask. Am I some sort of Mother Teresa saint in Australia? No. And just quietly, a few home truths. Have you thought of doing a runner? <laughs> <laughs> Let me out of here. Hi, I'm Liam Bartlett. I'm Tara Brown. I'm Peter Overton. And I'm Liz Hayes. Those stories and Peter Harvey's mailbag tonight on 60 Minutes. This program brought to you by the intuitive new Camry. The car that reads the road. <laughs> Packed with dynamic sports features, a powerful VVTI engine, a five-speed manual or gated automatic, and an agile sports suspension. New Camry Sportivo is so intuitive, it can even sense your excitement. Intuitive new Camry Sportivo, the car that reads the road. The point of all this strange behaviour is to show you that ING has superannuation products to suit people in all walks of life. So no matter what you do, ING can make super easy for you. How? By giving you the choice of leading investment managers as well as insurance and other benefits. So if you choose ING, Super will become a walk in the park. Australia's most sensational no deposit interest free offer ever! Look on you 50 months interest free with absolutely no deposit! That's no money down and no interest for 50 whole months! Look on you! Catalog out now! The best man. Until Wednesday at Target, get 20% off underwear, socks and hosiery. Exclude sleepwear. When your roof starts to leak. Repair, repair don't replace. replace. When the tiles are cracked. Repair, repair don't replace. replace. When the house needs a facelift. Repair, repair don't replace. replace. Repair and restore for a fraction of the cost. Adelaide Property Restoration Services. Call for a quote today. You have just four days to get your tickets for the Porsche and cash early bird prize in the QEH Research Foundation Home Lottery. Plus, your ticket is entered in draws for more than 2,600 prizes, including the Scott Salisbury Grand Prize Show Home. Order your tickets now.
pain stop you doing what you want? Try Voltaren Rapid 12.5 tablets. Painful inflamed areas attract Voltaren, which concentrates its action where you need it most. Voltaren quickly relieves muscle and back pain to help get you moving again. Voltaren, the joy of movement. Let's make your home stunning. Combine your good taste with our know-how and endless choices. Result? The look you love. Got the decorating bug? See the decorating bug. 81 Unley Road, Parkside. All right, pay attention. Super just got a whole lot better, but you'll have to be quick to make the most of it. Would you like to know more? Ask your advisor or call ING on 133665 for a free booklet on how you can benefit from the new Super Rules. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, was your killing Demetrius James excusable? CSI Sunday. A ghost from the past. Well, you have no idea what you killed when you killed my brother. Cast doubt over a good cop's future. And what is in the bottom? This one's got to be seen to be believed. New season CSI and CSI Miami. You got him. CSI Sunday, tonight from 8.30. From childhood, we're taught to fear and loathe them. Just think back, there's the big bad wolf of the fairy stories, the werewolf in the horror flicks, even Wolverine from X-Men. Evil, dangerous, bloodthirsty beasts. So how could anyone possibly make friends with a pack of wolves? Good question. And there's only one bloke with the answer. Sean Ellis is from that rare breed of researchers. Part genius, part crazy. He spent 20 years studying them in the wild eating, sleeping, living with wolves, trying to learn their language, finding out what makes them so frightening. It really is hair-raising stuff. No wonder they call him the Wolf Man. This is for real. It's not some circus stunt. Sean Ellis actually lives, eats, and sleeps with the wolves. It's an extraordinary experiment. Most scientists stand back and watch, but Sean's in there, teeth and all, learning how to communicate with these wild animals. Everybody's gonna think some guy that lives in here with these guys for 18 months, shares their world, shares their food, is gonna be crazy. And maybe they're right. Maybe you do have to have an element of craziness in you to do this. Sean's experiment is taking place in the most unlikely location, an animal park in the sleepy west of England. He's pretty heavy. Oh, yeah. I've arrived right on dinner time. Best not to come empty-handed. Look at him. They're getting excited, aren't they? Done. Yeah, it's good. Dinner time, Mr. Wolf. Oh, yeah. Okay, can I go through first? But first, Sean wants to introduce me to the pack. Lead the way, Squire. It's good. I'm just going to come have a look at you now. He tells me I'll be okay. The trick is to stay calm no matter what. Yeah, right. Well done. Excellent. The term big bad wolf comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah, these are not big and not bad. All he wants to know is where you're going to be. Are you a threat to his position? Um, how strong are you? All the information you're now giving him will tell him that everything's okay. Around the world, conflict with humans has decimated wolf numbers. But Sean believes his research can help save them by understanding and using their natural behaviour. What I wanted to do was find out about their language from inside their pack. Teach the wolves all they need to know to be in contact with us, to stay away from farms and ranches and boundaries. Almost as a tribal elder. Yeah, a tribal elder, a wolf tribal elder. Good point. Are you going to eat any of this? Uh, I might have a tuck in, actually. Well, see how we go. <laughs> You're a better man than I am. <laughs> all right, let's stick it on the dinner table. OK, mate. Sean believes to really understand the wolves, he has to do what they do, even eat what they eat. Well, I'll let you uh, have a good feed. Bon appetit. Oh. 
Is the wolf really in danger of extinction? Some are. Um, some wolves are very, very threatened, some subspecies of wolf. People fear the wolf. They fear what it does. They fear what it can do. And because of that, they can very quickly plummet in numbers through culls or through shooting and fear-based shooting at that. This conflict between wolf and man breaks out everywhere they live side by side. Like at America's famous Yellowstone National Park. Sean studied the packs reintroduced here 10 years ago after being wiped out by shooters. He's watched as the wolves have invaded nearby property, angering the local ranchers who now want to resume culling. We can't be completely pro-wolf and completely pro-farming. We have to be somewhere between the two and try to get the two to understand each other through an experience and acceptance of each other's world. Three years ago, Sean's worldwide search for an answer brought him to this little corner of England. And by chance, he found just what he needed. Three young wolf pups rejected by their mother. The more I'm trying to get it apart, he's clamping down more and more. Sean sets out to raise them from scratch. It's a little wolfy love bite. Following the behavior of a wild pack as closely as possible. To anybody watching, that might seem very, very cruel, biting a young wolf on the ear to make him squeal. But the squeal is very, very important to his development because he's giving you a sound that means you've hurt him. He moves in with them, becoming their teacher, their den mother, day and night and in all weather. Even hiding morsels in his mouth for the pups, just like adult wolves in the wild. We've come to know and love this family, and to me, they are brothers, sisters, father, mother. There's constant wrestling as Sean establishes the social hierarchy of wolves, crucial for survival as a pack. It's dangerous work. As the pup's strength grows and they vie for dominance, there are fierce confrontations. He's frequently bitten and covered with wounds. He got to the stage where, where you no longer bother. Um, you go and get stitched up, come back, the wolves take the stitches out, clean the wound, and, and it heals in a fraction of the time. So this was the, only... The a, wolves take the stitches out? Yeah, they, they, they have a, an ability to heal you. you. Just keep constantly cleaning until the wound is so clean that it heals in a fraction of the time. As you'd expect, he's had problems with worms. But amazingly, Sean's as healthy as he's ever been. I bet you've had some ticks and fleas. Yeah, ticks, fleas, worms, um, everything that, that dogs have had at one stage or another I've had. Wolf worms. Wolf worms, it's great. Um, but the irony of it is you get very little with these guys. Colds, flus, upset stomachs, ironically, now seems a thing of the past, and you're never more healthier than you are in here with these guys. But Sean's obsession with the pups did take a great toll on his own family life. Finally, his wife left him, taking their four kids. It's lovely. Mostly it's a sandpiper. But then he found his soulmate. Here we go. Oh, lovely. Great, thank you. So we're getting all fat down. <laughs> Helen Jeffs, a childcare worker living here in Coombe Martin. So you like his wolfy smell? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Be careful how you yes. answer. Yes. <laughs> No, it never really, it's just, uh, when I met Sean, that's what he was. He's always been the wolf man, it's his, you know... Well, I mean, some of your how... friends actually asked the same question. Oh, yeah, well. yeah, it was quite a, a standing joke really. of like, yeah. oh my God, you know, does he not smell? And how could you want to kiss him after he's been with the wolves and things like that? But never, it never really bothered me at all. I Still, never... with Sean spending most of his hours in the wolf enclosure, meetings were rare. And obviously she, she couldn't see me at that point because obviously I was raising the pups, so we used to communicate to each other by howling across, across the, valley. the valley so i'd howl with the wolves and she'd answer me and then so i'd howl the, back it's the only contact yeah, we had seriously yeah. it was very romantic yeah. how do yeah. you how do you howl to say i'll see you down the pub in the <laughs> <laughs> i protected that one yeah. Yeah. Can you teach me that yeah, yeah. Well, then you... okay sit yourself there but won't they jump on my head oh, that should be fine. <laughs> being in love with a man so consumed by wolves helen soon came to love them too now she's part of the team. 
Let's give him a greeting. Good. Well done. And she knows, better than most, that even young pups like these <laughs> pose real dangers. The ferocious power of the wolves' jaws is twice that of a German Shepherd. I find it very, very frightening. I worry so much for him when he's in there. There's been some nasty occasions, and, and, and for me, um, being Sean's partner, definitely the, the, the bites onto the back of the, the head and the neck are the, are the worst. He's had concussion from yeah. the walls oh, yeah. compressing the back of his head. Absolutely. Since the experiment began, Sean's position in the pack has changed. He started out as top dog, but as the wolves grew, he allowed Yana, the alpha male, to take over. Sean's now looked on as the peacemaker, often stepping in when fights break out. I still can't help but feel it's a bit like swimming with sharks. Mm. It's always that unpredictability, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. But it makes no sense to them to hurt or injure um, or kill something that's going to help to protect them. Um, and it's almost, it would be rude for them to do anything to you without asking me. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> the two boys are very much strength orientated, trying to push against yeah, you. Yeah, he is. And this is a, a good key at the moment, because if you're on a food with him, you've only got about eight inches in which to feed on. So if you push back against him, show him that you're strong enough to hold your own, then he takes more respect from that. Yeah. I guess that's what they mean by body language. That sounds good. That sounds good, yeah. But these guys have other ways of expressing themselves too. Smell that. Oh, oh, thanks very much. That's okay. And he's not the biggest, or not the, the more dominant of the pack members. It, it almost makes your eyes water, it takes does. your breath away. Um, so that's, that's what, that wolf pee is yeah. a present for me. Isn't that's it? a present for you. That's to say to you, I've now found out about you and what you're all about. Now, this is me. And you're expected now to identify him through that scent. But the wolves' most powerful way of communicating is their distinctive howl. When they were tiny, Sean taught the pups how to do it. Sean's now convinced he can use recorded howls to keep wolves away from farmland. In the wolf world, this is a territorial warning. When they hear it, Sean's wolves become restless. In the wild, they would flee. Sean now has a secret weapon to control marauding wolves. At last, an answer for the farmers and ranchers from Europe to Yellowstone. So by broadcasting that sound out into the hills, it keeps all the other wolves away. Yeah, basically we say to them that this particular area, farm, a ranch or town or a city, is already occupied by a pack of wolves. Sean Ellis is a dreamer whose years of studying wolves have taken him closer to their world than any man before. Do you ever wish you'd been born a wolf? <laughs> it's tempting sometimes when you, when you spend long periods of time with them. Um, I think where I am at the moment between both worlds is where I needed to be, interpreting the wolf world to the humans and the human world to the wolf. But now, he wants to go further. To live with them in their remote mountains and rangelands. To answer the call of the wild. Out there, running with the wolves in the wild, that's got to be my ultimate goal. Coming up. Proud, huge moment. It cost us approximately $300,000. Oh, wow, I did that. I helped these guys Give me that. achieve this goal of having children. That's next on 60 Minutes. The siren sounds to start the big team to add a kick off and away with the ball comes the Kluger CV7 seat at just 39,990 drive away. Plus kit accessories worth $1,400 for just $900 extra, including park assist, nudge bar and floor max. The selectors have gone for depth too with a lineup featuring ABS brakes, dual front SRS airbags, cruise control, CD player and seven seats all clear. All points. So get your kicks between April 1st and 30th at your local team to add a dealer. If you're over...
over 50 and not working full time, Apia gives you the choice of insuring your car for an agreed or market value. So call Apia on 135050 for understanding, not just insurance. <laughs> Nothing compares to the big taste of a KFC filler. A warm nine-inch roll filled with loads of tasty ingredients and two breast filler crispy strips in our new range of flavours. Can't beat it, can't beat it. KFC fillers. Can't beat that beat. Oh, Joan, Foxtel's going for quite the low price. Yes. If you want Foxtel, you can subscribe for just $36.95 a month. I suppose. If you like good value. It'd be better in a boat. Make your dreams come true with a boat from Adelaide Outboard Marine. Boats for fishing, cruising, water sports. It's like a boat show all year round at Adelaide Outboard Marine, Melrose Park. Hi, I'm Carol. As owner of Profile Wardrobes, I ensure that quality and value are built into every Profile Wardrobe. Call us now at Profile for what's on special this month. The work sale is now on with the new 2007 Microsoft Office. Compatible with Windows Vista and Windows XP, you'll get better results faster and easier. Prices start at $244, also available online. Office Works, the works. Wow, the Adelaide Home and Garden Expo. Words just can't describe how much there is to see and do at this year's expo. The ultimate home and garden solutions. Don't miss the Adelaide Home and Garden Expo at the Adelaide Showground, Wayville. What could we get you? Maybe a new knee? <laughs> no, I have 75 golf sacks. <laughs> Mr. Corns, call me Chad. Chad, what can I get for you? Don't fancy the pav, I'll have the crows on toast. <laughs> Mr. Goodwin, your order. Uh, I'll have the game, thanks, with 32 touches. Oh, hungry. Mr. McLeod, are you eating tonight? Yes, I'll have the uh, back flank, and very well done, thank you. Okay. Nice. Can I interest anyone in the main course? Savour the wisdom of football's biggest names. It's a footy feast only on National 9 News. Oh, that is hot. For most couples, having a family is the most natural thing on earth. But for a surprising number, it can become a real trial. Some seek help through IVF, others are forced to use surrogate mothers to incubate and deliver their babies. It's parenthood with a price as high as $300,000. Often there's frustration, anguish and disappointment along the way. And always there are cold-hearted laws and mountains of red tape. That's what makes the families in this story so remarkable. What makes their joy so special. And what makes it so understandable that many Australians, even those in high places, want our old-fashioned laws on surrogacy changed. Lisa Banfield has just become a mum, but unlike most mothers, she gets to cut her baby's umbilical cord. And for Lisa and her husband John, it's not one baby, but two. Joshua and Lucas, brought into this world by a surrogate mother in America. What did it cost you to have a surrogate and to have a family? It cost us approximately $300,000. To have your two boys? Correct. But worth it? Absolutely worth it. Three years on, and Lisa and John can't imagine life without the boys. It's been a monumental struggle to have their family. 
In the past 10 years, Lisa has been diagnosed with cancer, twice. First at the age of 29 with cervical cancer, then a second time in her stomach. I was given 50% chance of living another 18 months because it must have been a dangerous strain of cancer. It was eager to hang around. But Lisa survived after years of chemotherapy, radiotherapy and a radical hysterectomy that meant she could never bear a child. It was a huge, a huge operation for a young, a young woman to have. You have no womb? I have no womb, no fallopian tube. Lisa's inability to have children, how did that affect you? I loved her dearly and I, I wanted to live with her for the rest of my life and whether we had children or not, uh, was uh, was irrelevant. So if you wanted to have children, you had to make a decision that you'd literally have to rent a womb? Absolutely. And that's when surrogate mum, Chrissy Prelowitz, came into their lives. I knew I wanted to help somebody else have children. I already had mine. I wanted them to be able to feel the outcome of that, and I was happy to do that first nine months, and they can do the rest of the 18 years. <laughs> Chrissy was registered with a Californian surrogacy agency when she was matched with Lisa and John. <laughs> the Banfields were forced offshore to rent a womb because commercial surrogacy is illegal in Australia. Can't advertise for them, you can't pay them for their services can't put a little notice in the local Coles supermarket, surrogate wanted. Amniocentesis, you said you did not want an amniocentesis. No, we don't. Commercial surrogacy is a tightly run business in the States. The average cost for one child is about $130,000. Because I think the contract's all finished. Have you had your consultation with the attorney on the telephone? Yes. With the contract locked in, Chrissy was implanted with an embryo created by Lisa and John. Miraculously, despite all her treatment, Lisa was able to produce her own eggs. Now, it was all up to Chrissy. I was the incubator, and I was the oven that carried John and Lisa's buns that needed to be baked. Lisa's oven was broken, mine worked. I helped her out for a few months and gave her her baked goods, <laughs> her two buns. So you never felt anything more than an oven? Oh, it was not my genetic baby, so that made it very simple. That was, for me, a very clear-cut way to establish the difference. It's their biological children. Okay, Lisa hasn't seen me in eight or nine weeks, so if she's wondering how the boys are doing, let's check. <laughs> <laughs> baby boy A, head down. Body, legs over here. People have asked, as well, are you worried about the fact that Chrissy would ever take off with your babies? And do you know what the interesting thing is? Hmm. It's not the surrogates who want to take off with the children after they're born. It's actually couples changing their mind is more of an issue. It's a hard, hard for baby B feeding a little bit faster. After an anxious nine months, John and Lisa returned to America for the birth of their boys. They're in good position, so we'll get the show on the road here. All right. I've got the cruisy part of it, and it makes me feel extremely guilty. <laughs> I do. No, push, push, push. Lisa had been dreaming of this day for so long, but somehow the moment was bittersweet. I was angry because it should have been me. Should be me getting all the attention and me bringing our children into the world. I felt very hard done by. But then I just got my head together and realised, Lise, look what you're about to become and have. A mum, finally. Baby A, Joshua, was delivered first. And seven minutes later, baby B, Lucas, arrived. Both healthy, both perfect little boys. I was really just so overwhelmed by the birth of the boys, but at the same time, I was so absolutely conscious of spending as much time as I could thinking about Chrissy and being with her. First thing we did was hand the boys to Chrissy. Yeah. We took yeah. the boys, one each, when they'd 
wrapped them up and handed them to Chrissy. They were both on either side of me. I was looking at them like that, going, oh, okay, and then looking at John and Lisa, and then, here you go, here you go. <laughs> it was great. So how did that experience compare to the birth of your own children? It was much more emotional internally with my own. And I was just an observer immediately after I gave birth with John and Lisa. Now, I'm sitting on him first. Now, I don't know how I'm going to get that over you. More and more couples like Lisa and John are heading overseas for a child. But a very small number of children are born in Australia to surrogate mums. Thank you. See you guys. Six-year-old Pippi Rushford is one of them. Pippi's mum, Fiona, was on IVF treatment for nine years without success. But then her sister, Laura, offered to be a surrogate. What's so special about how you were born? Um, I couldn't grow up in my mum's tummy, so I, got, I had to go into my auntie's tummy. Do you think of her as your auntie? Um, I actually think of her as my half-mum. Really? Yeah. Why do you think that? Um, because I came in her tummy. Is it your right as a woman to have a baby? We'd like to think so, and, and the sad thing at the time was all our friends were falling naturally, preg pregnant naturally. It was like, well, when's it my turn? When's it my turn? Sort of thing. Yeah. Laura, you're looking at your sister who's desperate to have a child, and you've already got your own. I fell pregnant really easily, <laughs> so it was pretty hard for Fiona. And, um... I think I, I watched her go through one of her miscarriages and it was awful to watch. How's your breakfast? Is it staying in your tummy? Yeah. To have Pippi, Fiona and Laura took advantage of a loophole in our fertility laws. While commercial surrogacy is banned throughout Australia, it's legal in some states for a friend or relative to act as a surrogate. You're living in Victoria, where it's illegal? Yes. Laura's living in Queensland, where it's illegal? You're almost having to go underground to have this child. It was a big, big hurdle. And we had to travel to Sydney, go through Sydney IVF to have, carry out the um, procedure. After extensive screening by the fertility clinic, Laura was implanted with Fiona and her husband's embryo, and baby Pippi was born. And when we, you know, the obstetrician pulled her out of Laura's tummy and Laura goes, she's here, your daughter's here. And there were tears all around. It was a very emotional moment when she was born. A lot of people have said to me, I could never do what you did. I couldn't give up a baby. And I just say, well, it wasn't my baby, it was Fiona's baby. So, oh no, it was great, it was fantastic to be able to give her that and to give her that happiness. I mean, it was an incredible gift. And yes, we're sisters at the end of the day, but to offer to carry a baby for someone else and then hand it over is phenomenal. Pippi has grown into a delightful little girl, but six years on, Fiona is still fighting to be recognised as her mum. According to the law, the birth mother's name goes on the birth certificate. How does that make you feel? Shocking. I mean, I know in my heart and my soul I'm Pippi's mum and she loves and cuddles me as her mum. But if I were to produce her birth certificate here and now, it shows that Laura is her mum. And how does that make you feel, Laura? Oh, it's ridiculous. It's just it's so archaic, the law. So I'm legally responsible for her. And if Fiona wants to take her overseas or do anything, I have to sign the passport. I have to give her the OK. Well, what can you do now? Well, at this stage, Peter, I have to adopt Pippi. Adopt your own daughter? Adopt my own daughter. The wheels on the bus go round and round, all over the town. It was a different story for Lisa and John. Their names went straight on their boys' birth certificates. Under Californian law, the surrogate, even though she's the birth mother, has absolutely no rights. No rights on the birth certificate. No rights to take them home for a period of time, just in case she changed her mind. No, she achieved what the intended purpose was, which was to provide us with children, and we had a wonderful result. 
Clinical, business-like, excellent, great, clear-cut. You walk away happy. Win-win. It might sound cold and clinical, but it's not. Lisa and John have kept in touch with Chrissy, and today there's a special reunion. There's Chrissy! You should come over and say hello. Give her a hug. Chrissy has arrived from Los Angeles to see Joshua and Lucas for the first time since they were babies. Big Lolikas. Big Lolikas. Oh, you guys. Come on. When you came through the airport this morning, I was like, wow, I did that. I helped these guys achieve this goal of having children. And I helped in a big way. And there the, there's the proof right there, running and saying hello and being happy, active, great kids. What started out as a business deal has evolved into a strong friendship. Of the $300,000 Lisa and John spent trying to have a baby, Chrissy received about $60,000. But she says it was never about the money. Altruism was the guiding factor in this, definitely. And one of the surrogates broke it down to, I think it was five cents an hour, when they figured payment versus time put out. So it's not, it's not about the money. It's very much about helping somebody. Mm, where is it? And she offered, after the boys were born, we had remaining embryos, she'd do it again without any money. And that's, I've got like goosebumps just saying that right now. Not because I don't want more children, but because that was just such an amazing thing to do. Does the offer still stand, Chrissy? <laughs> <laughs> we did it immediately. No, we're very happy with that too, aren't we? <laughs> we're Aren't we? I look at Chrissy and I don't even have a chance. <laughs> You're off the hook, don't oh. worry. <laughs> Bye, Chrissy. The way it's turned out has been an additional blessing to have stayed connected this way. And I like how in the ultrasound it says, made in Australia, assembled in the USA. <laughs> Joshua and Lucas are too young to understand who Chrissy is and why she is so special. I'm so excited she's done this. But the lady with the American accent will always be a part of their life. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Would you ever not tell them that they were delivered by Chrissy? What no. do you honestly think? <laughs> it will be one of the proudest moments proudest moment just imagine to be able to sit down and tell your children look how hard we work to bring you into this world because we don't own you it's your life to go on but proud huge moment <laughs> coming up come on it's about time to get time for the revenge of the nerds you, you don't care if they think you're a nerd. I couldn't care less. No, you don't care. How can, how can you have it's a... called being progressive. How do you take the mickey out of him? <laughs> Let me count the way. <laughs> That's next on 60 Minutes. Bird's back in a funniest feud ever. What's the right thing to say when a woman asks, do I look fat in this? To you, Russell. Hell no. First Family Feud returns Monday, 5.30. Channel 9. Packed with dynamic sports features, a powerful VVTi engine, a five-speed manual or gated automatic, and an agile sports suspension. New Camry Sportivo is so intuitive, it can even sense your excitement. Intuitive new Camry Sportivo. The car that reads the road. The best man. Until Wednesday at Target, get 20% off underwear, socks and hosiery. Exclude sleepwear. Like to cut your energy bills by up to 30%? Reduce greenhouse emissions by up to three tonnes a year? You can, with a Rheem Solar hot water system. Plus, you'll get over $1,000 cash back in environmental rebates. No wonder everyone's going solar. Over 30% of your energy bill is wasted just heating water. Solar can cut this by up to 90%. Energy costs keep rising, so stop wasting money on heating your water. Call Solar Solutions now. 1300 Go Solar. <laughs> Okay, 
it's over, wasn't it? Well, I have to go to the shop. It shuts in ten minutes. Well, the guy in front of me, he, he was going just as fast as I was. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm running like running like running like running like. Speeding. There's no excuse. Sanitarium are committed to helping every Aussie grow up healthy, happy and full of whole grain goodness. So we've asked Coles to bring you super specials on selected Sanitarium cereals. Hurry, this week only. In Australia, up to one million children regularly go to school without having breakfast. So Australian Red Cross Good Start Breakfast Clubs are helping by serving breakfast more than 500,000 times a year. It wouldn't happen without much needed support. To see for yourself just how good a roof made from Colourbond steel will look on your home, visit Springbank Waters Display Village, Springbank Boulevard, Burton. Learn the truth about plastics. Can they really cause cancer? And we reveal the early signs of eating disorders. Fresh new What's Good For You with new presenter, <laughs> Gian Rooney. Monday, 7.30. Channel 9. Right now, he's the hot favourite. After five months, the infatuation with Kevin Rudd is still going strong. According to the polls, if they had an election tomorrow, he'd be our new PM. A dream run, and all the more amazing when you consider how little we actually know about this man. Sure, he's a bit of a swat, clever, ambitious, never lost for words. That's about it, about all we've been allowed to see so far. And let me tell you, Team Rudd runs a tight ship. It's all control with a capital C. Getting to know the Rudds isn't easy, but occasionally the family does let its guard down. And that's when politics gets interesting. Hello, Kevin. G'day, nice to be back. Kevin Rudd should have Thank been you. the quintessential Queensland country bloke. This is where Dad would uh, occasionally have an amber fluid. <laughs> <laughs> Raised in tiny Umundi, as he tells it to his wife to raise, it all sounds like a pretty ordinary 60s childhood. I used to stand here and the window would open and Dad would reach out and hand you a cherry cheer, <laughs> which is lemonade with uh, a huge dose of raspberry cordial. That's so bad for you. <laughs> but somewhere on the way to becoming a regular Aussie bloke, Kevin Rudd took a different road. A detour that turned him into a Mandarin-speaking diplomat who prefers Bach to the Beatles. G'day, how are you? Look, I get a sense that you have had to spend some time de-nerding yourself. <laughs> he says rapidly, adjusting his glasses. Yes. <laughs> That's true. Um, do, you, do you feel as though you do have that image of being, a, you know, fairly straight? <laughs> the, um, this is the time for the revenge of the nerds. Come on, it's it? about time. To, yeah. Time for the revenge of the nerds. I mean, have you had to make some conscious effort to... I don't know. Look... I reckon the Australian people spot a phony at 50 paces. You don't care if they think you're a nerd? I couldn't care less. I'm me. You know? Have you got any ideas for the election? <laughs> <laughs> and so far, Australians seem to like what they see. If the opinion polls are right, they're about to send this 49-year-old family man to the lodge. How long do I get for a speech, by the way? Um, about a minute and a half. <laughs> I've never, ever spoken well, to you. I know. That's not fair. But right now, Kevin Rudd has a more pressing matter to deal with. The upcoming wedding of daughter Jessica. The, uh, what are you doing? Are you doing waltz? No, we're doing rumba. Are you doing bridal waltz? No, we're doing rumba. How can you have a wedding without a bridal waltz? <laughs> it's a bridal rumba. <laughs> No, you understand no, this? How can, how can it's, you have it's a... It's called being progressive. <laughs> we move past the bridal waltz onto the rumba. I've never been to a wedding where you well, have... Well, you're about to. <laughs> <laughs> it's Kevin. nice to meet you. My name's Jennifer. Kevin's always been a serious insect. Ducks of his school, and then on to the Australian National University to study Chinese. I was a bit of a swat. I mean, let's not pretend that I wasn't. 
No wild parties, no. Oh, a few parties. Yeah. Define wild. Well, what, did you inhale? <laughs> <laughs> I know the smoke's nor inhale. <laughs> you did nothing. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> oh, I don't mind the odd tipple. <laughs> It was here at the ANU's Bergman College that young Kevin met Therese, his bride-to-be. Therese, am I right in understanding it was not love at first sight? Ah, well, it was... <laughs> it was interest at first <laughs> sight. And um, uh, then uh, sort of about 18 months of deep disagreement, hatred and argument. Um, hatred's probably too strong a word, really, but um, we disagreed about just about everything, and then it was love. They've now been married 25 years and have three children. Jessica, who's 23, Nicholas, 20, and Marcus, 13. But nothing in Kevin's previous career as a diplomat and Queensland government bureaucrat matches the demands of running for Prime Minister. How stressful is it for relationships, politics? You've obviously, had, you've had 25 years together. I mean, mm. you've had to work out a way for it to s survive, I guess. Mm. So you have to be able to take the mickey out of each other, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> How do you take the mickey out of him? <laughs> let me count the ways. <laughs> <laughs> Can you let me have, well, just a little, just one. Just give me a hint. Will you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's not the only high achiever in the family. Therese owns a $175 million job placement company with more than 1,300 staff in four countries. And thanks largely to the Howard government's privatisation of job services, Therese's company receives millions of dollars in Commonwealth contracts. Your business does benefit from federal funding. Do you think you may face a conflict of interest if Kevin does become Prime Minister? What Kevin has said he would do is go and consult and seek the best possible advice. Um, and I will then do whatever the advice is. So I'll do what's right for the country. So if the advice is that you really can't be in this business, that's a step you'll have to take. Um, I think we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, if we come to it. Therese, you're a wealthy, successful businesswoman in your own right. Are you an asset or a liability for a Labor Prime Minister? I understand what business is, I understand how it works. So I think that's a positive for any possible Prime Minister, isn't it? The federal election is still months away, but the undeclared campaign is well and truly underway. It's 6am in Canberra, and the only people awake are the cleaners and Kevin Rudd's election team. And as I discovered after a week with Kevin Rudd, this is how it is every day. Okay, what have we got? Um, five issues a day. Hicks obviously running hard in the telly. Stern actually is appearing pretty strongly. A schedule that runs at breakneck speed. <laughs> Interviews. Kevin Rudd, good morning. Good morning, Chris. What is the Labor Party's position on David Hicks? Meetings. Yeah, welcome. Off we go. And emissions trading, that's done. A policy launch. Oh, good. Hello. <laughs> A chat with school kids. Hey, I'm Kerry. Kerry. Everything planned, everything strictly controlled. Except for this. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Rudd. Much appreciated sharing your um, knowledge with us. I'm sure you'll gain something from it. And also, um, just quickly, my um, every time you're on TV, which is quite funny, <laughs> my mum says that she went on a couple of dates to you. Um, um, up at Nambour, she said. Her name was um, Kim Ossif. Yeah. Yeah. Where do I hide? <laughs> <laughs> you did well. Yeah. You're a gentleman by all reports. Yeah, so right. you didn't say that. That's terrific. That's good. Thank you, guys. Thank so, you very so much. Say hi to your mum. And we'll just stop that right. <laughs> Kevin copes just. And then in a flash, the campaign wagon rolls on. Good Lord! How 
often would you get home? I seem to be only home one or two days a week. How long can you sustain that? So long as the Ever Ready battery holds out. <laughs> as long as it takes. I've learned one thing from Mr Howard, is that he works really, really hard. So do I. Next day, and Rudd and his shadow environment minister Peter Garrett are on the campaign trail in North Queensland at the huge Blackwater coal mine. Are they happy to see us? Oh, I hope they so. happy to see you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Is this going to be good? Yeah, yeah, they'll be happy They're to always see. happy to see you. <laughs> you sure of that? I am, I am. Rudd is the consummate politician complementary to his hosts. This is uh, an important part of Australia's economic present and Australia's economic future. Brutal to his foes. Senator Bob Brown was out here a month ago floating the idea of shutting down the industry. What do you say to claims about like that? I think uh, Senator Brown has got rocks in his head when it comes to that matter. It's what coal miners want to hear and it's a message he's happy to hammer again. Bob Brown has rocks in his head when it comes to the future of coal. And again. I've got one message for Bob Brown, and it's this. Bob, on this question, you got rocks in your head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rod knows he's carrying a lot of baggage. The last time a Labor leader went to the polls, it was Mark Latham, who not only lost the election, but spectacularly lost the plot. Well, if you can organise yourself like... Uh... Yeah, you want to get on six civilised people. Yeah, well, you, you've got a bloke who was uh, wanting to be the Prime Minister and you all in, got behind him. That's true. Who then declared that the ALP was a shit can. I think we're all left a bit gobsmacked about, um, about uh, how all that came out and how he behaved once the election loss occurred. Um, Do you think that's still in the minds of people, though, particularly when it comes to ticking that ballot box again? I think they see me a little differently. <laughs> So far, Rudd's had an unprecedented honeymoon for a new leader, although there have been several attempts to sully his character. There were question marks over his memory of how his family were evicted from their home and over his infamous lunch with disgraced WA Premier Brian Burke. Go get him ready. Have you ever lied as a politician? Certainly not knowingly. You've never lied to save your skin? No. no. You've never lied because it was convenient? No. Am I some sort of Mother Teresa saint in pu public political life in Australia? No. Um, do I get stuck into the other mob uh, when I think they need getting stuck into? Yes. Um, am I some paragon of political virtue? No. Um, I still think you've got to level with people. So you would never lie? I would never knowingly uh, lie. You throw in knowingly because you can well, accidentally lie. Well, I'm just, just, I'm just saying that um, you know, that's, uh, that's, the way in which I, that's the way in which I see it. This is the first time Kevin Rudd has been back to the family's Umundi farmhouse since a car accident claimed the life of his father in 1969. There's a kitchen out the back there. Yeah, all right. Yeah, come on. Do you want to come in? Rudd was 11 when he and his mum left the farm and has always claimed they were evicted. This was uh, where I used to bunk, in here. Oh. Okay. It all looks a lot smaller. Than well, this. <laughs> that version of events is now disputed by the previous landlord's family. They say they're insulted by Rudd's story and claim Mrs Rudd was given plenty of time to move out. What do you remember of being asked to leave? Oh, it was a tough time and... Uh, and uh, some pretty um, strong things were said and, um, and mum had to go. But uh, it doesn't uh, detract from the fact that the, uh, the time I spent here as a kid growing up was just fantastic. And the fact that somebody else has a different memory of those events? I think anybody wants to try and defend the, um, the memory of their father. I understand that. I understand that. And um, just as I'm attached to defending the memory of her mother. You see it as that? Although it was more of a, a, I guess politically, it was viewed as an attack on your honesty, I guess. It's not so much an attack on your mum. Yeah, it's just politics, yeah. Like, uh, I remember it all pretty clearly as an 11-year-old kid, so that's life. Yeah.
I like your stars. For Kevin Rudd, it's just the beginning of the biggest year of his life. Jessica's getting married. Is it sort of pure white or creamy white? I'm not trying. Nick turns 21. I'm, I'm not a natural. Have you inherited your father's natural sense of rhythm? Yes, the rudd rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> that is, it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> and Kevin turns 50. Okay, Therese. You've got a wedding this year. You've got a 50th. Yes. You've got a 21st. You've got a 21st, Nicholas. You're turning 21st. And you've got an election. Yeah. Have you thought of doing a runner? <laughs> <laughs> Let me out of here. <laughs> That's where you learnt to dance. That's where I learnt to dance. Yeah. The Pride of Erin. Pride of Erin, all the way yep. through. The Rudds are an almost impenetrable, politically savvy family. It's like they've always known this time would come. Uh -huh. They fail. <laughs> and they know better than anyone that voters don't just need to like Labor, they also need to like Kevin. And if you don't win this election? The possibility doesn't exist. <laughs> There's no such thing. If I succeed, terrific. But I'm not about to think of the alternative. You won't see no This one's got to be seen to be believed. CSI, next.